think we are live. So, hello everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. This is the closing session of our conference. It's a great pleasure to introduce you, or perhaps just to reintroduce you to professors James Conant and Stephen Moho. Professor James Conant is a Chester District Professor of Humanities at UChicago and Humboldt Professor at the University of Leipzig. He works broadly in philosophy and has published articles on topics in philosophical logic, epistemology, philosophy of language, philosophy of mind, aesthetics, German idealism, and the history of analytic philosophy, among other areas. Uh, the, the topic of his presentation is the invisibility of directorial perfection, Hitchcock's psycho, and the respondent will be Professor Stephen Moho. Professor Moho is a Russell H. Carpenter Fellow and tutor of philosophy at Oxford, New College, Oxford. His interests include Wittgenstein, Heidegger, and Nietzsche, the philosophy of religion, and the relation between philosophy and the arts, especially film and literature. His most recent publications are The Great Riddle, Wittgenstein Nonsense, Theology and Philosophy, On Film Third Edition, and The Ascetic Ideal, Genealogies of Life Denial in Religion, Morality, Art, Science, and Philosophy. As I said, it's, it's a great pleasure to have you both here. I just want to uh, use a little minute here to acknowledge my own personal debt to both of you. I would probably not be here or co-hosting a conference on Capel if it weren't for, for both of you. I first, I think the first work by uh, from Moho that I read was a paper of his about Blade Runner that I found somewhere on the internet. And he used Cavell, Wittgenstein, and some other references to discuss my one of my favorite movies, perhaps my favorite movie. And that was a revelation to me that we could do such a thing, talk about movies that way. And then I went to Oxford for part of my PhD and I had the opportunity of discussing some of my, my ch the chapters of my dissertation on Wittgenstein. And his, those uh, discussions that we had with, were really important to me and I still remember them fondly. And then Jim, I first read his work on, on Wittgenstein as, and I knew him as a resolute reader of Wittgenstein, the Tractatus. And I, after I, I met him personally in 2014, I think in Chicago, and I discovered that he was also interested in lots of other things that I was also interested in besides Wittgenstein and Cavell, film, skepticism, and many other topics that are very important to me. And as my students know, it's, it's, there is hardly one semester when I don't use either or both of you in, as my main references for the courses. So I'm really, really glad to have you both here, especially to talk about a movie, a director, and philosophy, and Cavell. So thank you very much. And Jim, please. Uh, go ahead. You have the word. Um, could I could I ask just one question? Um, how long yes. should we talk for? I can I can control myself. Uh, uh, around number? 45, 50 minutes. Perfect. I, uh, so and if you want, I can also remember yeah. you. I can do this. Um, very good. Thank you. Okay. So um, I'm sorry the text I sent you was um, such a mess. Um, I was wanted to write something. I had a paper. Um, uh, there's only a couple of things like this. So there, this is not a normal thing for me, but I was invited to give a paper on psycho um, and, and, and in a, a German lecture series um, for the public, and I was kind of intrigued by this. It's partly why the, the paper starts the way it does, by just talking about Hollywood and worrying about what Europeans think about Hollywood. But so it's a paper I originally wrote in German, and then I wanted to have an English version of it. And my thought was I'd use this conference to create that, but then I got sick. I'm sorry that the version I sent you guys a couple of days ago still had some German sentences in it that I was sufficiently tired that in reading it through, I didn't even notice they were in the wrong language, which gives you an idea how sick I was. Um, but I think everything's in English now. Um, so, um, so the thing I sent you, I'll skip all the parts that are single space and I'll just kind of focus mostly on the reading of 
psycho and especially the shower sequence but um as i said to um steven and steven definitely took me up on this you're, we're welcome to discuss um the parts of the paper i won't read out if people have looked at it so let me start um so i'm on page five if you're looking at the text i sent i think it comes more naturally to the european than the american intellectual to want to draw some kind of sharp distinction between something called high art on the one hand and low art on the other or as the germans would put it between hohe kunst and bloße unterhaltungskunst um, high art and entertainment art i suppose would be a way of translating that the distinction that i have in mind here is one that's supposed to exclude the possibility of a work of art in some way being both great art and um what the germans would call unterhaltsam um, entertaining. A great Hollywood movie is by its nature a kind of work of art that not only challenges that distinction, but this is what I'm going to argue, subverts it by pretending first to respect its terms. A great Hollywood movie, as I'm going to put it um, in this talk, has a false bottom. On a first feeling, you can believe that you're, consult, you're consuming a mere piece of Unterhaltungskunst. But in order to understand that same movie on a more careful viewing, you need to come to see that the movie has exploited your willingness to underestimate it to its own ends. So um, I'm going to argue now that Hitchcock's movies are classic amp examples of structures that contain this sort of false bottom. One way of putting this is to say this. On a second viewing, we begin to become unable to miss much of what we found it easy to miss on a first viewing. And there are all kinds of ways one could exemplify this. We discover countless double meanings in the dialogue. We uncover all sorts of ways in which we attach significance only to those things we think we're supposed to notice. Um, and in these ways, we come to appreciate the almost endless degree to which our gener generic expectations shape our initial experience, what I'll call the world of the movie. Another way to put this would be to say, one has only really seen a Hitchcock movie if one has watched it at least twice. And that means to discuss such a movie in any depth, one must take care to describe what a viewer is apt to see in a first viewing as well as to draw attention to what is likely to remain invisible in such a viewing, including a great deal that can only become visible upon a subsequent viewing. Now, Psycho contains many moments that, if we you know how to look out for them and to trust them, can serve to warn us that this movie is not what we're inclined to think it is, or what the average viewer is inclined to think it might be inclined to think it is on a first viewing. On a second or third viewing, these, mo these moments will immediately acquire significance that we are unlikely to attach to them on a first viewing. On a first viewing of the film, we work with an understanding of the movie genre, its dialogue, even its opening credits, that allows us to miss the significance of a great deal that's right before our eyes. I make this point with respect to the credits and how even if we just watch the credits carefully, we would have reasons to worry about things. Um, that we might not um, notice. Um, a topic on um, which um, Cavell and Pippin concern themselves relatively little, I talk about Cavell and Pippin in the preamble and their conception of genre is, is what I call the overt intermingling of genres or some a kind of in painstaking engagement of generic expectations by a movie that has no intention to confining itself over the course of its full development to anything like an exploration simply of the internal possibilities of that genre, the one in which it initially appears to participate. But many of Hitchcock's films do this, and Psycho is an example. And the way um, he does this, this kind of equivocal and internally subversive relation to existing film genres is characteristic of a very particular genre of movies that, for lack of a better word for the moment, I'll just call the Hitchcock movie. And I'm interested in the ways in which, in this respect, Psycho is a typical Hitchcock movie. Not every 
thing that Hitchcock made is in this sense a full-blown instance of a Hitchcock movie, but there is a lot of them. <laughs> and I uh, have a few remarks about Vertigo here, but Psycho is going to be my example. Uh, what I do next in the paper, and I think I'll skip a bit of this too, is I adduce various respects in which um, this film engages all of our expectations for the film noir. The way it starts out makes it appear clear that what we must be watching is a film noir. I quote Robert Pippin on this. Um, and some of the features he um, spells out. And then I say at its outset, Psycho appears to present us with an instance of that genre of film, the one that Pippin seeks to delineate in that enumeration of generic features of the film, film noir that I quote from him. That is, Psycho appears to satisfy each of the earmarks of that genre. Early into a first viewing in the movie, the crime around which the action psycho seems destined to revolve is Marion Crane's theft of the money from one of her boss's clients. As each twist in the plot cascades into the next, the central interest of the plot would appear to be one that pivots around the ever ramifying consequences of this one act, which she just seems to get in more and more trouble each thing she does. Um, the larger social context of her crime the one that matters for Pippin on his account of the, the film noir, the historical American world, if you will, in which the action takes place, appears to be at least as bleak and amoral as her deed herself. And her impulsive crime notwithstanding, she continues to strike us within that world as by far the most attentive character anywhere in sight. Indeed, no small part of the reason why her initial theft of a considerable sum of money is so laughably easy for her to perpetrate is precisely because she's regarded by those who know her to be a paragon of decency, stability, and responsibility. Yet, in a matter of a few moments, through a single reckless act, she's transformed right before her eyes from a reliable office worker into a criminal on the, on the run, terrified by the mere sight of the policeman. In taking ourselves to understand the sorts of things that I'm giving examples of here, we take ourselves as we begin to watch Vertigo for the first time to know which genre of film we find ourselves in. We quickly fall into assuming that we know more or less what awaits us. That is, we take ourselves to understand at least the rough shape of the horizon and possibilities for what can happen in the world of this movie. And it's not easy to count the sheer number of misapprehensions we thereby, in making that one assumption, fall under all at once. The false bottom that's created in this way, by the creating and defeating of generic expectations, is just the beginning of the myriad ways in which Hollywood movies seek to invite us to underestimate them. A much more local but equally characteristic device can be seen in the countless moments of dialogue with double meanings that can be found in any good classic Hollywood movie, be it a noir, a Western, or romantic comedy. Hitchcock's particularly relentless in the use he makes of such double-edged moments of superficially, apparently innocent conversational banter. A line is delivered, which in a first viewing of the movie, we take ourselves to understand. On a second and further subsequent viewing, we suddenly hear an undertow of irony in that line, omitting a hidden meaning which can only become fully audible once we appreciate how far the apparent world of the movie is from its actual reality. Sometimes um, the irony can lie in a way in which a line in which we construe it in a very literal way admits of a far more interesting or alarming figurative reading. I think this is the more typical way in which this happens in Hollywood films. But in Hitchcock films, more often than not, it works the other way around. It's a function of the way in which an all too familiar turn of speech, one which we naturally assumed is to be understood figuratively, that is, our ordinary understanding of it has a kind of dead metaphor in it, suddenly admits of a far more interesting or alarming super literal understanding, a reading that upon its discovery on some further viewing of the movie may stop us in our tracks. 
Indeed, the task of understanding a line of dialogue in a Hitchcock film is often a matter of construing a particular expression or turn of phrase in a far more literal way than you ever have before, as if you were coming to understand that, what that particular set of words really means for the very first time in your life. When Norman says to Marion about the Bates Hotel, we keep on lighting the lights and following the formalities. We think we've plumbed the depths of this line in a first hearing. When Norman says, my mother's not quite herself today, we think we know what he means. When Norman comes to the topic of private traps and says, and none of us can ever get out, we, we scratch and we claw, not only at the air, but only at the air, only at each other, and for all of it, we never budge an inch, unquote. We think he is speaking hyperbolically. It is only upon a second or a third viewing of the film that we might suddenly be struck in a manner that's apt to cause us either to laugh out loud or gasp that each of the things that he says here are quite literally true. Mother literally is not quite herself today. One mark of a great work of art is the way in which it seems to unfold within itself an infinite degree of intention. Far more than anyone, it seems, could have possibly managed to place into an artifact crafted by mere human hands. So that every aspect of the work appears to contribute in some essential way to its overall unity of meaning. If we're talking about a great poem, this means that the resulting whole, whole seems to require that just these words be spoken in just this order, each one recurring precisely where and how it does, with just these possibilities of alluding to or withholding what is said, with just these assonances and dissonances, with just this rhythm and meter, just this length of line or duration of, of line or duration of rhyme or lyricism or pathos or degree of refusal or restraint with regard to any or all of the above. If we're talking about a truly great movie, this would mean that every murmur or scream we're able or unable to hear, every violin stroke of the soundtrack, every camera angle and movement, everything that is shown or withheld from view, the brevity or length of the duration, every shot or pan, not only the number of cuts in a montage sequence, but every dimension of rhythm and pacing in such a sequence, everything that belongs to the work carries aesthetic significance and contributes essentially to the unity and power of the whole. If the soundtrack were allowed to view the, the viewer to hear a bit more or a bit less of what is happening in that world, or to allow it to be heard differently, or to see a bit more or less, or to visually present it in a different manner, one would through one would through the alteration of this one seemingly tiny aspect of the film, thereby mutilate the whole no less drastically than if one were to attempt to alter a single line in a Shakespeare sonnet. This classic conception of the unity of a great work of art is certainly not one to which every Hollywood director has aspired, but it most certainly is an ideal to which Hick Hitchcock aspires. There are not many moments in the history of cinema that can fully measure up to this standard of aesthetic perfection. Say that's set by a Shakespeare sonnet. But there are some. If such perfection is achieved within the construction of a sonnet, then it will be immediately evident to us that we cannot tinker with any part of it without ruining the whole. If, however, such a unity of the relation of the part to the whole is achieved within the construction of a Hollywood film, then even their very aspiration to measure up to such a standard may tend to go unnoticed. This holds true even if the moment in question is as famous as any in the entire history of Hollywood cinema. And that is what I aim to show in this essay by attending in detail the famous constellation of successive shots in Psycho. Um, that is um, the shots that comprise the shower scene. 
Before we attend to that scene, let us pause over the scene that precedes it, in which Marion and Norman befriend one another as she sits in the parlor of the Bates Hotel, surrounded by stuffed birds and nibbles at the sandwich that Norman has prepared for her. The way in which this bit of dialogue is shot invites us, on the one hand, to imagine that we find ourselves in one of Hitchcock's films of emotional rescue, that Norman and Marion, through one another, might each respectively enable the other to free him or herself from their respective traps. On the other hand, as the dialogue builds, we are also put in a position to begin to appreciate that Norman may be disturbed in further ways, ways that any such form of friendship will be powerless in the face of. On a first viewing of this scene, it's likely that, though we mom momentarily sense this presence of a darker undercurrent, we nonetheless permit our sense of what is occasionally disturbing in Norman's modes of expression to be eclipsed by our sense that we are what we are presented with here are the first glimpses of something that smacks of friendship, of a human encounter in which two lonely protagonists allow each, uh, them, allow each other to appear vulnerable. Now, this permits us to realize various things. One is how little friendship there's been in the film until now. The conversation in the parlor between Marion and Norman invites us to understand ourselves to be in the world of a very different movie than the one which we later discover we are actually absorbed in. In the movie we initially understand ourselves to be watching, we are absorbed in a world in which the conversation between Marion and Norman could hold the key to Marion's salvation. This reinforces our sense that Marion is the heroine of this movie, that she might already just be on the verge of trying to take control of her fate and the consequences of her impulsive act of theft. The beginning of our first distinct glimmer of a doctor, darker undercurrent comes when Marion wonders whether Norman's mother can be put someplace. To this question, Norman responds, a madhouse? We begin to see a new side of Norman as he goes on. I couldn't do that. It would be like bearing her. I don't hate her. I hate what she has become. I hate her illness. Every one of these lines upon a further viewing will come to admit of a more literal reading than any we had initially deemed possible. We'll come to appreciate more than one sense in which Marion's proposal that he put his mother someplace is quite literally something Norman cannot do. And so far as there is something that literally satisfies this description, that someone might be able to do, putting her someplace, it would not just be like burying her, rather it would involve their literally burying her, remedying the fact that, as we later learn, the grave bearing her name in the local cemetery is empty. The climax of our first distinct glimmer of this darker undercurrent comes with Norman's next words. We all go a little mad sometimes, haven't you? But in a first viewing, we're apt to try to rein in our conception of just how mad you need to have gone in order to count as going a little mad. If we can keep our conception of madness sufficiently reined in, then Norman Bates will hear simply seem to echo Robert Pippin's fundamental thesis about film noir, namely that in the wake of a single impulsive act, such as Marion succumbing to her sudden urge to make off with the money, the following general proposition might reveal itself to be no less true of you or me than it is of a particular character who represents the prototypical noir protagonist. Characters who had been righteous, stable, and paragons of responsibility all their adult lives are in such movies seemingly and quite believably transformed in a few seconds into reckless, dangerous, and even murderous types. That's Pippin on the film noir. So on this first reading, in accordance with our initial generic expectations of Norman's remark, we all go a little mad sometimes, haven't you? What it means is we all have the capacity to do something which, with a bit of bad luck, could cause us to become the counterpart of a protagonist in a film noir. As we later upon subsequent viewings come to appreciate how this remark might serve as a motto for the movie as a whole, we'll find ourselves drawn to more radically literal controls of the significance of this line. 
Now, that's just a handful of quick examples of how in some further viewing of the film, one can begin to appreciate how the false bottom in the movie, on the one hand, and its exploitation of noir conventions in the other, neatly dovetail with one another. The task of discovering how this remark of Norman's and a great many others about finding that one is no longer oneself today, about not hating someone else, but only who they have become and so on. These remarks admit of at least two different readings. One that allows it to epitomize a classic noir problematic and one that allows it to crystallize the thematics of this Hitchcock film. And coming to discover this is not independent of the task of coming to appreciate how this movie exploits a handful of central conventions of the noir in order to confer an entirely new meaning on them. One that explodes the genre from within. The reading of the sentence that we need to work our way towards upon some subsequent viewing in order to understand the world of this movie and fathom its genre will need to come close to being the opposite of the reading of Norman's remark. We all go a little mad sometimes, haven't you? That Marion herself immediately arrives at. The film thereby character, performs one of its characteristic double movements, obscuring from view in a first viewing what sort of movie it is that we are watching, while simultaneously preparing the way for our, discover, for our discovery on a further viewing of a scorching irony. For Norman's utterance of that sentence initially appears to have nothing less than an almost magically therapeutic effect on our protagonist. She breaks into a wonderful smile after he says this. It's as if this line helps her to see the folly of what she's done. This line frees her from her trap. When she eventually responds to it, she says, I'd like to go back and try to pull myself out of it. Back to Phoenix. She confesses all sorts of things in this remark um, and goes on to confess others, like that her real name is Marion Crane. So this really does seem, after all, on a first viewing, to be a movie whose action will turn on a tale of emotional rescue. The ingredients for, sure, for such a plot will seem to be fully in place now. This does not mean that some horrific plot twist will not foible Marion's happy intention to go back to Phoenix and try to pull herself out of it. But it does mean that we have come to acquire a certain horizon of expectations, a certain conception of what may count as a case of their fulfillment or frustration within which the plot of the movie can now play. Against this horizons, questions such as the following gain pertinence. If Marion went back and returned the money, what would happen to her? And we later learn in, in one of the ways Psycho deepens our subsequent sense of irony, that indeed the victims of the crime, we only learn this after she's dead, are willing not to press charges as long as the money is returned. Until now, the film has been about Marion Crane, the consequences of her impulsive act. She's committed a foolish crime. It's gone a little crazy. But we all go a little crazy sometimes. But she has, with Norman's help, managed to begin to free herself from the trap into which she's placed herself. It's evident that the camera likes her and that we're supposed to like her. Given the conventions of Hollywood, it's also clear that she is the star of the film. She has been on the screen almost all the time for the first 40 minutes of the action of the movie. If we know anything about how such movies work, surely we know this. This movie is about her. If we know anything about a Hollywood movie, we take ourselves to know other such things, such as this. We need to keep our eyes on that pile of money wrapped in a newspaper back in her hotel room. Whatever exactly this movie is about, whatever happens that money will matter. There are just a few, these are just a few of the examples of the sorts of things we think we know 40 minutes into watching this movie. The last time we see Marion Crane fully acting under her own power, she steps into the shower, ready to purge herself of her crime and wash herself clean. From that point on, we are gradually deprived, step by step, as the action unfolds, of each one of these things we unreflectively took ourselves to be able to know about what sort of movie it is that we are watching. It is in this, among others, that the shower scene constitutes the pivotal moment in the structure of Psycho, dividing the movie 
not only on a first viewing into a first part and a second part, but also on a second viewing. As we come to watch an entirely different first part of the movie than the one we saw or heard on our first viewing, thereby preparing the experience for a completely new experience of how the second part completes the first. Hitchcock's often rightly called a master of detail, and the shower sequence is arguably the most rigorously, rigorously premeditated and designed scene to be found in his work up until that point in his career. Seventy-eight pieces of film make up the 45-second sequence. In order to make this bit of movie, he had to storyboard it shot by shot. This task of fully and accurately describe any the task of fully and accurately describing the scene is therefore not an easy one. It requires distinguishing all sorts of things, among others, what we are likely to see from what there is to be seen what we're likely to see in a first viewing from what there is to be seen on a second and so forth. What we are likely to see will depend among other things upon whether in the midst of the first or the second or the third view. It is indeed likely to require that at least a third viewing take place for one to sufficiently detach oneself from one's engrossment in the world of the movie to be even, even to be able to even begin to notice all that is extraordinary in the manner in which our access to that world is mediated through the manner of construction of the scene. Let me just begin by noting some of what we do not see. We do not see a blade pierce skin. We do not see any shot of nudity that would violate the letter of the Hollywood censorship code. Why? One might argue that the reason that the sequence is shown in this way is that is so that Hitchcock could get the scene past the censors. Well, this might be true. But to think that this is the whole explanation would be to sorely underestimate the artistic accomplishment of this scene. This is the cinematic equivalent of answering the question, why does Shakespeare end the first line of Sonnet 116 with that word? by saying, so it will rhyme with the last word of the third line. It is true that he needs it to anticipate the rhyme to come. Any idiot can see that. The task of the critic is to help us to appreciate how very much more it accomplishes than just that. What while it accomplishes that. If the critic is successful, then the idea of a perfect translation of Shakespeare's sonnet into Ger German say one that, among other things, perfectly captures its every nuance of significance while perfectly rhyming, perfectly mirroring its rhyme screen, scheme, will strike us as an absurdity. My suggestion is that we should find the following idea no less absurd, the idea of a perfect remake of Psycho, and hence of this sequence, one that fully recaptures every aspect of what is achieved in the original construction and depiction of the shower scene. In the book by Robert Block, upon which this movie is loosely based, the shower matter is a brief affair, a matter of an instant. The Norman Bates character kills the Marion Crane character, a single, well-placed thrust of the knife. The cinematic equivalent of this manner of depicting the murder would last a single second as we watch and perhaps hear the knife penetrate her body. Yet in Hitchcock's Psycho, in order to kill Mary, the knife must be raised and driven towards her flesh a seemingly uncountable number of times. Why must this character, who may be killed off in a single short moment by the author of the potboiler rendition of the narrative, die like this in Hitchcock's movie? And why must the manner in which we, the viewers of the movie, experience her death, be mediated through such an unprecedentedly elaborate and cinematically dense 45 second long, 78 shot montage sequence. Now this entire sequence, the shower scene, is, as many have noted, immediately recognizable as involving some degree of cinematic virtuosity. 
This is perhaps most evident when it comes to the last shot of the sequence, the zoom away from Marion's head, collapsed and squashed against the bathroom floor. That was a shot that was technically difficult to put off. And even shortly prior to that breathtaking pull away shot, there is evident virtuosity. For instance, in the false tear that we have in the drop of shower water on Marion's face. But my aim in what follows will be to direct our attention elsewhere, not to these moments of what we might call patent virtuosity in the sequence, but to its many dimensions of latent virtuosity. For the point I wish to make below is how much of what is cinematically extraordinary in the sequence will escape our notice if we approach it only with an eye to what is self-evidently extraordinary about it. One feature of the sort of accounts of the medium of Hollywood cinema that I have here have been opposing is the way in which they more or less directly imply a certain conception of the nature of aesthetic achievement in the movie. They implied the moments of greatest aesthetic significance in a movie are those in which the spectator is most violently alerted to the means by which the significance is affected. Such a theory pushes one in the direction of almost having to hold that there's an inverse correlation between the degree of one's or absorption in the world, the narrative and dramatic action of the movie at a particular moment of one's involvement in it and the degree of aesthetic significance or interest that may rightfully be claimed on behalf of that absorbing moment of cinematic art. This pushes one in the direction, not just of being attentively disposed as a fine critic would be, to linger over moments of pain, yet nonetheless genuine cinematic virtuosity, such as the false tear in Marion's inexpressive face. It can also push bad, so-called theorists of film, much further into forms of altogether poor criticism, born of bad theory. Such theoretically top-heavy forms of criticism tend to commit themselves in advance to theoretically privileging what we might call cinematically theatricalized moments of filmmaking. Moments that interrupt our absorption in the world of the movie precisely in order to call attention to themselves as somehow meta or self-reflection, or otherwise ostentiously, philosophically pregnant in some way. It's not an accident that so those film theorists who love such movies, ones that appear to have been made with the needs of such a film theorist foremost in mind, also tend to love Hitchcock's films. But in so doing, they often tend to mistake what is comparatively shallow in Hitchcock's layering of cinematic structure and meaning for its depths. Okay, now I want to attend more closely to certain features of the shower sequence in Psycho, One, namely those that depend upon what I'm here calling its latent virtuosity. First, let us consider for a moment what this episode would have had to have been like if it had been filmed in a more continuous manner, without montage, with a comparatively stable point of view. The most immediate consequence of this is that it would have been difficult to avoid a fairly graphic and stomach-turning depiction of tremendous violence and carnage. For the scene to fulfill the purposes Hitchcock requires of it, the details of the brutality of the scene unfolding before our eyes must take place largely in our imagination. For what we are, for what we are directly given to see though it conveys a forceful understanding of the form of the event as one that is horrible and brutal, almost entirely abstracts from the sensible matter that would allow us to immediately visually or orally apprehend it as such. This is a characteristic hallmark of Hitchcock's art, to terrify us all the more by placing us in a perfectly measured degree of indirection in our relation to that which terrifies us, thereby allowing it to take hold of our imagination in a way in which a direct glimpse of it never could. One might sum up the governing maxim of this dimension of Hitchcock's craft as follows. Never directly show the viewer anything that will detract from the power of what she will experience if she must fill in what she sees 
through the work of imagination. Hitchcock's treatment avoids turning our stomach by aestheticizing the horror, abstracting from a representation of the totality of the scene and fleeting instead from one detail of it to the next in a manner that allows us to receive a vivid impression of violence, brutality, and despair while showing us relatively little in the way of blood, guts, and gore. There's much that could be said in this connection about what we do not see that another director might have shown. We do not see Marion's injuries. We do not see blood pulsating from her wounds. And there is much to be said about what we do see, which another director would not have the camera dwell on. The showerhead, the drain, the blood shown only when highly diluted with water and swirling down the drain. This forceful conveying an impression of violence, brutality, and despair in the absence of any focal depiction of the physical trauma sustained allows a maximum of shock to be communicated via the intellectual and emotional registers of our understanding of what is presently happening in the world of the movie, while provoking relatively minimal immediate physical revulsion and recoil from the details of what is happening in that world, in the moments of it, which we are actually permitted to see. This gap, between what we see of and what we understand to be happening in the world of the movie is the space in which the real action of the movie itself unfolds. But there's much else that this scene accomplishes in the context of the movie. Here are three comparatively obvious descriptions of tasks it must accomplish. One, a transition in default point of view. Two, a concealment of the identity of the murder murderer, and three, an appreciation of an absorption in not only of what has happened, but of its significance. It must give us time to absorb the significance of what we're seeing. When I say it's obvious it accomplishes these tasks, then that itself is an observation whose obviousness is available only to someone who's already seen the entirety of the movie at once. Once. And so in a first viewing of the movie, even these most obvious aspects of what the sequence must accomplish are in no way apparent to a viewer. These dimensions of filmic virtuosity can only emerge from their latency phase and gradually become fully in focus for us over the course of second, third, and fourth viewings. One reason that it's not merely fitting but necessary that Marion not be disposed of in a cinematically banal, temporally punctate, and visually straightforward manner is the following. The shower scene must negotiate what I've called a transition in the meaning of the default point of view shot, and hence in the locus of identification for the viewer. The meaning of a default point of view shot in the movie until now has been that of Marion Crane. Its meaning must now be caused to shift so it can be identified with that of Norman Bates. Until now, the central character of the movie has been Marion. She's about to leave this world. The shock we undergo is not merely because a character in this world is dying in a horrific fashion, but because the center of subjectivity that has mediated our access to this world is before our eyes taking leave of it, threatening not merely the physical death of our heroine, heroine but the ontological death of the world of the movie. Gradually, over the course of the montage, most likely on a first viewing without our realizing it, what we see is refracted less and less through Marion's subjectivity and more and more through that of the murderer. The point of view were merely a, a literal or even just approximate seeing things from the angle in which the manner in which they appear when seen through someone's eyes. Then such a transition of default point of view could not be as seamlessly affected as it is in the course of the sequence. While our viewpoint in terms of what we see may appear merely to jump violently about, the viewpoint through which we see is being subtly renegotiated, and we accept this renegotiation. While being distracted by what is happening in the world of the movie, we alter the manner through which our access to this world is configured. A close description of the construction of the sock shower sequence, therefore, would register how the implicit point of view of the shots within the montage sequence serve to facilitate this transfer to a new mediating center of consciousness. 
Norman's way of expressing what we eventually take to have happened here and how one ought to react to it once this transfer has been completed is summed up by his distress cry upon apparently discovering Marion's corpse, corpse on the floor of, her, of the bathroom. Norman cries out, mother, oh God, mother. And this is how we understand what has happened. Not from Marion's point of view. <laughs> Now we come to a further end that the construction of the scene must serve, one of effectively serving to conceal the identity of the murder without, as I will call it, cheating. We thereby come again to a point in our description of the scene in, we must, in which we must carefully distinguish between what we will take ourselves to see in a first viewing and what we will go on to try to discover. We can see. On a second view, this can be made clear through a thought experiment. What would it mean to be given a maximally perspicuous view of the scene? What would we then see? Well, if there were a single no sustained non-close-up depicting the event of the murder, we would have no difficulty identifying the murder, the murderer. It's important that on a first viewing, we are enabled to rest with our assumption that the murderer is simply the mother. That assumption has been carefully prepared. We so effortlessly fall into making it that we are not conscious of the extent to which the camera's withholding from us any single fully crisp view of her serves to blind us to what might otherwise be clearly discernible aspects of the outline of the perpetrator we are given to see. The beauty about Hitchcock is, as I have said here, that he doesn't cheat. On a further viewing, on a second viewing already, if we're attentive, we're able to see all that we missed in this connection on the first viewing. We're able to see that the murderer has this mean of a spry, lean, upright young man, significantly taller than Marion, able to thrust the knife from above down upon her, while garbed in clothing most unbefitting anyone in 1950s rural California of his gender, build, and age. This dimension of the genre of the Hitchcock movie, its refusal to cheat, reaches its highest pinnacle, I think, in vertigo. And I say a bit about what I mean by that. Now, on a further viewing of the shower scene, as we're freed from the series of expectations that inhibit us from registering how very tall, masculine, and erect the bearing of this little old lady is, we become suddenly able to schematize our visual impression of the murder in a very different way so that on a second viewing already, it can organize itself into the gestalt of Norman, outfitted in the mother's garb and wig. That is in a form of attire in which we later see in the movie. What is withheld from view is therefore not literally invisible. It is simply placed in a manner that causes us over to overlook what we do not expect. And then on sub subsequent viewing, once we know what to listen and look for, to wonder how we possibly could have overlooked what now strikes us so conspicuously other than we had first imagined it to be. What allows in the case of the shower sequence in Psycho for this perfect degree of equipoise, invisible enough to go at first unnoticed, and yet fully visible enough to become at some later point suddenly, apparently unmissable, is the extraordinarily adroit handling of the technique of rapid montage. Fourth, this scene needs to allow us to linger over and absorb over time the extraordinary implications of what is suddenly happening before our eyes, while wishing to represent something that in itself happens suddenly and violently, in which, in order to have its power, must be conveyed in a manner that conveys suddenness and violence, while considerably extending its actual duration on the canvas of the screen to the depiction of certain other events. We need to be able to do two apparently contradictory things at once. We need to see something sudden and shocking, experiencing it as sudden and shocking, and we need time to appreciate that it is as sudden and shocking as it seems. We're losing our heroine, for example. While seemingly contradictory, in fact, each of these forms of our experience presupposes the other. It has often been appreciated that directors must find ways of contracting time that we do not experience as devices for contracting time. 
but is often less appreciated. There's no less critical for them to find devices for dilating time that we do not experience as thus dilating. Fifth in this scene, additional further silent steps are taken to subvert the film noir genre from within and prepare the way for the revelation of a previously unsuspected, adjacent genre. It is at this point that part two of Psycho really begins. In the series of moments that follow the shower sequence, moments in which we realize that we are no longer simply in a film noir, that the stolen money is a MacGuffin, that we are no more able to fully fathom the relation between the genre film we take ourselves to be watching and the one that we are actually watching, nor able to fathom the relation between Norman and his mother. The transition of viewpoint and identification for the viewer from Marion to Norman, from a character with which the viewer, as from a character with which the viewer, as she gets to know her, is increasingly able to identify, to one that increasingly eludes her capacity for identification, namely Norman or Norman slash mother. This transition of viewpoint presages this more profound and even less navigable transition from a genre of film in which the viewer can find her feet and feel at home to one whose dimensions defy encapsulation in any readily known innumerable set of generic earmarks belonging to any antecedently available genre. Now, um, let me just summarize and I'll just stop with that and. Um, let the rest of the paper remain on paper. Um, so here are the five moments that I've said, the five tasks I've said. The shower sequence is constructed and depicted in a manner to accomplish without our being able to notice this on a first viewing. First, there's a transition from one organizing center of narrative subjectivity to another. Second, there's this dilation of the temporality of the scene. Third, there's the asceticization of the har. Fourth, there's this, on a first viewing at least, concealment of the identity of the murderer, a withholding of our notice of it. Fifth, there's this insinuation of a false bottom in the movie's generic structure. These are all examples of ways in which, as I want to put it, we have forms of latent virtuosity. On a third or fourth viewing, we may come to appreciate the artfulness of technique, the efficiency of means, and the breathtaking simultaneity with which all five of these desiderata are realized in this one sequence of rapid montage. But what I want to emphasize right now in conclusion is that no one of these five purposes could discharge its office in the manner required of a Hitchcock film, unless they were able to do so in a manner that is invisible to a viewer on a first viewing. All that is apt to strike us on a first viewing of this notoriously famous scene is just that we've watched something that is self-evidently virtuostic, while failing to appreciate how that dazzling impression itself, its apparent self-evidence, serves to deflect our attention from where the real cinematic virtuosity lies, namely the extent to which the above five crucial maneuvers in the director's conjuring game are performed so as not to strike us at all. Thank you, I'll stop there. We need clapping sound effects. Thank you, Jim, that was great. Uh, well, Stephen, the virtual floor is yours, please go ahead. Okay, thank you, Unidas, uh, and thanks very much, Jim. That was a really interesting and rich paper. In fact, much larger than you were able to squeeze into your time this evening. And there are many things in it that I just simply agree with, but given the nature of my job, what <laughs> I've focused on in my brief comments are the aspects of it where I might be inclined to put up a bit of resistance. Um, I've, I've kind of organized the thoughts under three headings and, and one of which, which is probably the most distant from what you actually presented, um, has to do with the background setup of the paper that those of us who've had a chance to read it as a whole will be familiar with, but I'll just try and summarize it for those who haven't. So 
before Jim gets going on Hitchcock and on Psycho, he offers a kind of general framework in which he criticizes various more or less obviously mistaken ways of thinking about genre and the role of genre in structuring and informing our aesthetic reactions to film. And given that this is a conference about Cavell, I thought I'd pick up one feature of that discussion simply because Stanley crops up in it in conjunction with Robert Pippin, who's a much more kind of active influence in the discussion of Psycho. And there's a footnote where Jim quite rightly points out that the notion of genre that Cavell develops when he's talking about his two specific genres of the comedy of remarriage and the melodrama of the unknown woman, they're far more specific and tightly structured than those which usually attract the attention of scholars and theorists of film. And it's also essential, Jim points out, to Cavell's purposes that they jointly constitute a pair of what he calls adjacent genres, all of which I'm absolutely happy with. And then Jim characterizes the way Bob Pippin uses the notion of genre. He says that the two genres whose inner logic Pippin seeks to articulate and elucidate in his two books are far more capacious in structure and sprawling in scope. They're indeed two which even the most unlearned student of film has heard of, the Hollywood Western and the original American film noir. And Jim goes on to say that the latter two, the Western and the noir, precisely because of the enormity of their dimensions and membership, have often been dismissed as actually representing broadly stylistic or thematic categories of some looser sort, hence indicating something other than properly constituted genres. But, Jim says, building on Cavell's account of the matter, Pippin aims to show that this is just what they are. Indeed, over the course of his articulation of their characteristic features, they too emerge as a pair of interrelated adjacent genres. Well, I think, I think it's certainly true that both Cavell and Pippin make central use of the category of myth in specifying the nature of their chosen genres. But it seems to me that they make a very different use of myth in this respect, and that that difference entails that it can't simply be correct to say that Westerns and film noir emerge as adjacent genres in Pippin's work, at least not in Cavell's sense of the term adjacent, which privileges ideas of negation, which turn on how the founding myth of one of Cavell's genres relates to that of its companion genre. So I just want to spell out a bit what that more specific use of the notion of myth is in Cavell's work, if only to kind of raise the possibility of a discussion of just how close Pippin and Cavell really are with respect to their use of the notion of genre, even when, as in the case of Pippin's treatment of the Western, the notion of myth plays a significant role. So I want to begin by just quoting some passages from Pippin from the introduction and the conclusion of his book on the Westerns and American myth, where he says the following. He says that mythic accounts are about events in the remote past of decisive significance for the present, often about foundings. And they assume that the course of these events is the result of actions undertaken by heroes of superhuman abilities. The tone is one of elevated seriousness. So the form of such mythic storytelling is usually epic. And then he says in the conclusion to the book, I've suggested that the great Hollywood Westerns present in a recognizably mythic form, dimensions of an American self-understanding that's of great relevance to the question of the nature of the political in the American imaginary. I also wanted to suggest that such movies in many instances embody and present not just such a mythical self-understanding, because in ways that are technically subtle and somewhat elusive, some films also embody a kind of reflection about such mythological and epic self-understanding and occasionally sound a kind of warning about it. Sometimes it's the idealizations in the mythic narrative, themselves some sort of compensation for the absence of a long common historical tradition, which in a regressive way prevent a view of a more sober, realistic, pacific and reconciled modern secular life. In this self-reflective, somewhat modernist moment, some films can even be said to be about the end of the Western itself. 
the waning power of these narrative myths in our collective imaginary, the growing irrelevance, even if continued grip of such stories in our political self-image. So that all seems to me a very accurate characterization of Pippin's own um, work. And it resembles Cavell's in at least two significant respects, in the sense that Pippin's concept of myth captures the idea that they are accounts of origin, something Cavell emphasizes, and also in the sense that Pippin's account of Westerns incorporates the idea that Jim also emphasizes in his paper, the idea of a genre of film which doesn't simply participate in the genre, unreflectively reiterating its conventions, but actually engages in a kind of reflective and critical encounter with those conventions and hence with myth specifically. So thus far, the similarity is real, I think. But Cavell's use of myth in defining his two genres is, I think, much more specific. And it makes that notion of genre in relation to the comedies and the melodramas, I think, extremely idiosyncratic in a way that Pippin, I think, doesn't follow, at least on my reading of the, the book on Westerns and indeed the, the one on film noir. So let me just kind of summarize what I take Cavell's view about myth in its relation to the comedies and the melodramas to be. The first thing that Cavell emphasizes is that each telling of a myth is a retelling of it. The remarriage myth, as Cavell tells it, for example, patently offers a psychoanalytically informed retelling of the Christian myth of the Garden of Eden. Just as the Lady Eve offers its own retelling of that myth, and just as Freud elsewhere retells what we might think of as the original Greek myth of Oedipus. But of course, Sophocles presents his own account of Oedipus as a recounting of an ancient tale, one always already familiar to his audience and their predecessors, hence as an inherited account of the otherwise unaccountable origins of their community. After all, as Cavell says elsewhere, myths will generally deal with origins that no one can have been present at. And if no one was or could have been present at the true beginning of the cosmos, the polis, or distinctively human life, then second-hand accounts, that is, accounts which present themselves as recountings, as new versions of an absent earlier one, are the best we could possibly have. And in that sense, aren't really second-hand at all, since it makes no sense to talk of the original or first-hand version. Cavell, on my reading, applies this point in the present context in two ways. By all but declaring in his recounting of the myth of remarriage that the pair who are its concern have an essentially mythological understanding of the unaccountable origin of their own relationship, and by explicitly asserting that each member of the genre that inherits this myth constitutes a retelling of it. In other words, each member of the remarriage genre embodies a way of making sense of its identifying myth's way of making sense of things of marriage, but also in the terms of Cavell's construction of it, of sexuality, society, desire, separateness, finitude, and so on. Each such critical evaluation therefore amounts to a critical evaluation of the interpretations of all its fellow members, a view of the myth that is also a view of all the other views of that myth. Given that all accounts of a myth are recountings of it, Cavell's construction of it is likewise an interpretation or a vision. Since there can't be an unchanging essence of the relevant myth, an original version, Cavell's account is just as much a reconstructive version of it as are the versions embodied in any of the films. It is accordingly on exactly the same level, hermeneutically speaking, as the films it interprets, except that it's only arrived at by virtue of interpreting those films, that is, by individual acts of criticism of those individual acts of criticism. Finally, what those individual readings reveal, however provisionally, about the situation of the pairs in those comedies, provide the terms in which Cavell characterizes the situation of the comedies themselves, understood as members of this genre as medium. The pairs in the comedies engage in a conversation about how best to account for the unaccountable origins of their relationship. And it's in coming to appreciate this that Cavell is enabled to appreciate how each comedy engages with the other comedies in a critical conversation about the best, best available account of their own founding and unifying mythological inheritance. Likewise, 
As the pairs in the comedy struggle to manage transfiguration, and in particular to reconceive marriage as itself a transfigurative condition, as unending remarriage, so the comedies effect compensatory transformations on one another, which serve to disclose deeper reaches of shared significance in their relationship, and so disclose their individual mode of cinematic significance as itself always subject to reinterpretation in view of its present and future fellow members of the genre. One might say, just as the mode of being of the pairs in the comedies aspires to be one of continuous becoming, so the mode of being of the members of this and all genre as medium stands revealed as one of continuous becoming, as its meaning unendingly unfold, unfolds in view of future developments of the genre and of its critical reception. So one way of summarizing my sense of the significant difference between Pippin and Cavell here on genre, even when those genres are mythologically founded and identified, would be to say, that Cavell's notion of genre embodies a much stronger sense of the way in which interpreting the film leads us to discover that the film has always already interpreted not only itself, but those interpreting it, both other films and any viewer who is moved to interpret his own experience of that film. This is a version, I think, of his model of reading as counter-transference, the image or fantasy of the texts analyzing its reader. Okay, so that's a very general background response to one part of Jim's paper. Now I want to kind of focus more precisely on what we heard um, tonight. So the second theme I wanted to pick out was what I'm calling hidden literality. And this is um, a theme that Jim emphasized, a point he wanted to make about the nature of Hitchcock dialogue and its double-edged um, construction. And just to remind you in a, in a quote of one sentence of the point he was making a little bit earlier. In Hitchcock films, more often than not, this double aspect works the other way around. It's a function of the way in which an all too familiar turn of speech, one which we had naturally assumed is to be understood figuratively, suddenly admits of a far more interesting or alarming superliteral understanding a reading that upon its discovery on some further viewing of the movie stops us in our tracks. Indeed, the task of understanding a line of dialogue in a Hitchcock film is often a matter of construing a particular expression or turn of phrase in a far more literal fashion than one ever has before. As if one were coming to understand what this particular set of words really means for the first time in one's life. So that's Jim. Um, and that seems to me a really interesting and insightful way of thinking, not just about Psycho, but about Hitchcock's films more generally. But it also, given the context of this conference, reminded me quite strongly of Cavell's concept of Beckett's strategy of hidden literality, which he articulates in his essay on Endgame in Must We Mean What We Say? And I just wanted to give you a flavor of the way Cavell handles that, that notion, in part just to set up the possibility of making some comparisons and some contrasts between Cavell's sense of this theme in Beckett and Jim's sense of the theme in, in Hitchcock. So here's the first quotation from Cavell's essay in which he defines what he means by hidden literality in Beckett. This concerns the language Beckett has discovered or invented, not its use in dialogue, but its grammar, its particular way of making sense especially the quality it has of what I will call hidden literality. The words strew obscurities across our path and seem willfully to thwart comprehension. And then time after time, we discover that their meaning has been missed only because it was so utterly bare, totally, therefore, unnoticeably in view. Such a discovery has the effect of showing us that it is we who have been willfully uncomprehending misleading ourselves in demanding further or other meaning where the meaning was nearest. That's the end of the first quote. And of course, one of Cavell's exemplary instances of what he characterizes as saying only what your words say is Beckett's way with cliche, which he views as one way of ending something by undoing it. 
and which he further connects with the death of God, with prophecy, with the fulfillment of our wishes, and with madness. And so it turned out when I looked up the, the essay earlier today with Hitchcock. So here's a slightly longer quote from the Cavell essay, which activates all of those themes. From Beckett, no such statements emerge or not this way. We cannot see ourselves in his characters because they are no more characters than cubist portraits of particular people. They have the abstraction and the intimacy of figures and words and objects in a dream. Not that what we see is supposed to be our dream or any dream. It's not surrealism and its conventions are not those of fantasy. If this were a movie, its director would not be Cocteau, but Hitchcock. There is no other, there is no world just the other side of this one, opened onto through mirrors. Escapes, if they come, will be narrower than this. There is only this world, unenchanted, unsponsored, but more fantastic than we can tell. The unbelievable, the plain truth which you cannot tell, that others will think you mad when you try to tell, is one of Hitchcock's patented themes. Take two people as pointedly ordinary as Robert Cummings and Priscilla Lane. Have them discover during the war a plot to blow up a ship in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Have them momentarily elude the plotters only to find themselves in the midst of a private charity ball, the house owned by a colleague of the enemies, the immaculately proper servants guarding each exit, their only hope of escape lying in convincing the unknowing among the well-dressed mob of dancers and patrons under the crystal chandeliers and the spell of society dance music, that their socially prominent and conscientious hostess is a Nazi sympathizer, sheltering a gang of saboteurs. Why, anyone present would have to be mad to believe such a tale. Beckett's characters have such a tale to tell, but their problem is not to distinguish friends from foes under the tuxedos, for there are neither friends nor foes anymore nor to prevent a disaster from happening or a culprit from escaping justice. For no one in particular is the culprit and all disasters have taken place. Their problem is not to become believable, but to turn off the power of belief altogether, since it has become, because useless, the source of unappeasable, unbelievable pain. Suspense is for Hitchcock what faith is for the Christian, an ultimate metaphysical category directing life's journey and making the universe come clear and clean at the end. I could go on, but I think that's probably more than enough given the time to confirm my sense that there are a lot of overlaps here between with Jim's account of, of Psycho, particularly if we think of sabotage as another word for the undoing affected by what Jim calls superliterality. But the point of the comparison also lies in the way it highlights specific differences between Jim and Stanley here. For example, on Jim's account, it appears that the figurative dimension of Norman's discourse attunes itself to Marion's film noir world of existential despair and hope, whereas its literal meaning ties it to the madness that Norman calls home. So in these exchanges, something comes to an end, not only Marion's life, but her genre, but something also begins the new cinematic territory to which the film transitions on Jim's reading of the shower scene. And that's what I want to turn to in conclusion by focusing partly on what Jim calls the Hitchcock relation to genre or the Hitchcock movie and its bearing on the function of the shower scene as, as he reads it. So Jim identifies and distinguishes three different cinematic modes of engagement with genre mere participation, reflective exploration of its inner logic, and engaging the conventions of a given genre to other ends that are alien to that genre. And he offers three characterizations in the course of the paper of this third mode. And I just want to quickly quote those different characterizations, partly because they're not exactly the same and they have different connotations and, uh, and associations. And that's partly the question I want to raise and the invitation I want to issue to Jim to say perhaps a bit more about what he has in mind with this third mode. So to begin with, he talks about 
film that engages the conventions of a particular genre to other ends, alien to that genre, in order to take cinema to some entirely different place. And he says this relation to a genre can even characterize the work of the entire oeuvre of certain directors, an Orson Welles or an Alfred Hitchcock. And then in a later passage, which we heard just a few minutes ago, he says, the transition of viewpoints and identification for the viewer from Marion to Norman, from a character with which the viewer, as she gets to know her, is increasingly able to identify, to one that increasingly eludes her capacity for identification, presages this more profound and even less navigable transition from a genre of film in which the viewer can find her feet and feel at home, to one whose dimensions defy encapsulation in any readily innumerable set of generic earmarks or categorization by any antecedently available theory of genre. And then finally, the fifth of the points that he summarized at the end of his talk, when he's talking about the insinuation of a false bottom in the movie's generic structure, what Jim says at that point about this third mode of engagement with genre is the following. Like the placement of a pin into a hand grenade, it is the automatic assumptions that the viewer is induced effortlessly and unreflectively to make as she takes in this scene that pave the way for the subsequent explosion of the movie's participation in any hitherto familiar Hollywood genre. One that marks the movie's declaration that it participates instead in Hitchcock's relentless quest to disclose new forms of possibility and hence a new medium for cinematic art. Now, I find this third category of engagement or relation to genre really provocative and fruitful, but I'm also not entirely sure that I understand it. So really what I want to do to close my remarks is to invite Jim perhaps to say a bit more about it if he's in a position to. So the questions I have are three, or at least I've restricted myself to three. The first is that it strikes me as interesting that this third mode of engagement with cinematic genre is named after individuals. Is this just a coincidence? Or are we supposed to take it as a way of defining what Jim means by invoking those proper names as the names of directors, rather than as the names of historical individuals? The second question about Psycho and the shower scene is, what would Jim say in response to somebody who suggests that what's going on with the shower scene, the transition he's characterizing and drawing to our attention, is that it sutures a generic exercise in the kind of serial killer version of the horror genre with one in film noir. What's Jim's objection to that kind of characterization of what's going on in the transition? Is it that a film which affects a transition from one such genre to another can't belong to either, and so is creating a new genre? Or is the new medium that Jim claims is thereby disclosed something that can no longer be considered as a genre? I suppose really what's worrying me here is that metaphor of the explosion. Right? It makes me wonder whether it is really a, a new kind of genre or a new kind of relation to genre at all or something else entirely. And the final question, um, really is a, a further development of the second one and relates to a, a problem or an issue I have about Jim's account of the shower scene and in particular his account of Hitchcock's aestheticization of the horror, vividly imparting violence, brutality and despair while abstracting from blood, guts and gore in a manner that frees the viewer up to experience and navigate the other four purposes that the scene must achieve in order to enable the transition to the latter half of the movie, thereby preparing the ground for its climax. Now, this is certainly the most convincing account I've read of its length and its internal editing structure as a scene, but I still feel that something might be going missing here. Precisely because the abstraction is still a way of vividly imparting violence, brutality, and despair, I find that I'm not freed up to experience and navigate the scene's other purposes, no matter how many times I watch it. And I also feel that if I ever were so freed, I'd feel that this amounted to a denial or a negation of Marion Crane. 
And I wonder, actually, this is uh, a question that arises in Jim's remarks about the closing scene of Psycho that wasn't part of his talk this evening. I wonder whether having Marion Crane as a dead woman whose spirit is hovering over the rest of the movie might actually help to understand what's going on when, as Jim points out in his remarks about the closing scene, Hitchcock kind of moves from a concluding close-up on Norman smiling his mother's smile, cuts to, blends it into a brief image of the skull of his dead mother, and then moves to the car being dragged out of the swamp. I mean, it feels as if there's some kind of transition here between Marion Crane and the mother that might actually help to elaborate on what Jim has to say about the ending. But it may be that I'm just being too autobiographical here. It might just show that my worry about this stage of Jim's reading shows that I watched this film at far too early an age and that childhood traumas never entirely fade away. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Stephen. Please, Jim, go ahead. Sorry, Jim, you're mute. Well, that's appropriate. I feel speechless, but it's, it's good that I was mute. It expresses my speechlessness better than my speech could. Um, I mean, other people might be feeling this, but I have reasons to be feeling it more than anyone else. Um, um, and the feeling is something like how wonderful it is that there should be a Stephen Mulhall in the world. Um, um, it, it's just amazing. You know, he got this paper a few hours ago and that he produced these comments. It's, it's itself just a patent act of virtuosity. But also... Um, but also, um, there's just many great things. About, I mean, in, in, in bringing out my sense of, of what a, a thrill it was to read these things just before we started, I think I'll start with the second comment um, about Beckett. I mean, I read that Beckett essay when I was in graduate school. Admittedly, it's getting to be 40 years ago. But I read it, and it made a huge impression on me um, at the time. And so when I started reading what Stephen said, or in the quote, what he quotes from Cavell, and remembering the discussion of, you know, I don't think Cavell uses this word, but this discussion of what using my word, we might call the super literality of, or the, or the, the significance of a super literal reading of the lines of dialogue in Beckett's Endgame and how the whole work sort of snaps into place in a different way once you hear the words that way. Um, I, I felt like, I had some goosebumps already. I felt like, you know, this must have been my unconscious working, even though I didn't remember that essay or didn't think of it. Um, and then that experience went to another place, um, which was um, almost terrifying. Um, when I read on in the passage from Cavell, and I had to go get my copy and check it. Like, is he quoting Cavell? Doesn't make it absolutely clear, <laughs> but of course he is. That that Hitchcock comes up in that essay, the way he does, and and you know there is clearly almost an allusion to the line from Psycho. We all go a little mad sometimes, don't you? That uh, I dwell on um, even more in the paper than the talk, um, and so there. I mean, I just. That was a complete surprise that Hitchcock was that essay to me somehow. Though of course, if I once read it, I must have known that. Um, um, so that was just it's just amazing. But, um, but there's a lot to say about that. I would now, I think, like in rewriting or, or finishing this paper, is really what I should call it, um, to say something about the Beckett, um, Cavell and Beckett, you know, as opposed to Conan and Hitchcock or whatever, Conan and Psycho, Be Cavell and Endgame. Um, I mean, one reason I think I could have just not noticed the connection at all is because there is an extraordinary difference, um, 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 which makes this the connection that then Stephen brings out even more interesting in a way to me. And it, it makes a nice foil for, I think, giving an even sharper description than I do of this dimension of Hitchcock dialogue. Um, I would not say at all that a Beckett play has a false bottom. What I'm actually... Um, trying to demonstrate with those bits of dialogue is the way in which they contribute to one of the many respects in which the film has what I'm calling a false bottom. Um, I mean, this comes out even in what Cavell says in, in what um, Stephen first quotes from him 
about um, this. He says, um, the words strew obscurities across our path that seem willfully to thwart comprehension. Um, so that is, that's a kind of, you know, Cavell's attempt, I take it, at a quick take of what we initially seem to be experiencing when we watch um, Endgame. I think the first time I saw Endgame, actually, it was in French. Um, it was on a barge on Avignon. Um, you know, it was amazing performance. It was on a, a clay, wet clay stage, and the characters were also kind of slipping around um, as they tried to move in the space. Um, um, Avignon has this theater festival every year. Um, and the barge was full of sort of rich, rich French um, bourgeoisie. They also served drinks. <laughs> um, but, you know, by halfway through the play, I was just about the only person left on the barge. <laughs> They'd all left, you know, just kind of frustrated. They didn't understand what the hell was going on. Um, 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 but being a young American trying to take in culture in Europe, I stayed to the bloody end. I would, um, though having it in French on top of everything else didn't help me understand it um, at the time. But, um, but everyone left, you know. I can't imagine, you know, somebody getting that far into Psycho and the theater just kind of emptying out, you know, 20 minutes into the movie. That is, one doesn't feel as one listens to Marion and Norman talking that these willful obscurities are being streamed across, are coming from their mouths. One doesn't have the sense one's in the face of a work of such a high degree of modernist ambition that it's too esoteric or obscure for me. Um, 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 or that it's only for me if I'm a culture vulture. I mean, what gives it the false bottom is that um, one can one can get through that scene and thinks one understands everything perfectly. One knows what he means by, um, you know, he can't he couldn't put her someplace. I mean, we we know what he means when he says mother isn't quite herself today, and we know what he means with each of these lines. There's a way of understanding them. As I put it, you know, they each contain. Um, a dead metaphor that we're completely comfortable with. <laughs> um, and, um, and so they're, they're effortlessly understood. Um, so in the Beckett case, what we have is we have these strings of words that, you know, we have difficult to schematizing as meaningful at all. And then suddenly a schema presents itself in which we can find sense in them. Whereas what happens in the Hitchcock is we have a set of sentences that we effortlessly find sense in. And so I think it hits us in a different kind of a way. I put as we suddenly want to break out in a laugh or a gasp, depending upon whether the tragic or the comic side of the coin is, is the one that's sort of the, the face that is striking us in these remarks. Um, when we suddenly hear the line, mother is isn't quite herself today. And we realize, oh my God, <laughs> you know, and then we start realizing this, every line is like this, you know, um, and, um, and so that's what I mean by punching through the false bottom. We, we felt like we completely had our feet and we knew what kind of movie we were in the first view and we, we felt secure and we had a sort of, what I call in, um, there was a recent revision of the paper, a theoretical safe ground from which to understand it. And that safe ground just collapses. That's not what we have when we first watch a Beckett play, a safe ground from which to interpret everything, which then suddenly, you know, um, melts away. <laughs> um, so um, so that's why I think I didn't even think of myself as saying anything like what Cavell is saying. Um, but now Cavell mentions Hitchcock there, and it's so interesting. But of course, um, he's, he's focusing on, um, what I'm focusing on in my description of the false bottom, I'm, I'm trying to give a vivid description of what the viewer on what I call a first viewing experience is and how much, as it were, eludes us on such a viewing, which we then notice and eventually perhaps cannot help but notice on further viewings. And so, um, whereas the comparisons to Hitchcock that Cavell wants to bring out, um, we could say more about them, I don't want to take too much time, I want to say something to Stephen's other points, I think are ones that are made from the vantage point of someone who has watched a Hitchcock film and several Hitchcock films many times and appreciates sort of where we are once we've busted through the false bottom <laughs> um, and um, or busted through more than one false bottom even. And, and it's it's that world of Hitchcock that he's comparing to the world of that kid. Um, and, and, and invites these very interesting comparisons. So there's the point about the super literary, and then there's this comparison 
of, of their worlds and what kind, you know, and, and the way in which we remain in a condition of suspense where we want a kind of closure we cannot find. But, but I think that, you know, that sense of what I, you know, with the comparison to Vertigo call what is vitriginous about of these works, the way they don't admit that kind of closure. That's that's something that comes into view over multiple viewings, whereas I'm trying to catch something about the first viewing and, and something that's already lost or not simply there in the first viewing. And so I think it's quite complicated. <laughs> There's enormous difference, which then allows this comparison. And Cavell is focused on a very specific feature of Hitchcock, which in some ways is a very different one than the one I'm first trying to capture. But then this idea of super literality, as I call it, has a place in both, though as I was trying to bring out quite a different place. Um, so I mean I think it's very interesting and 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 worth thinking about some more. But um but but so so I would also put, you know, what I see as the greatest differences between the two cases, you know, not that I dislike what you said about that, but I think there's some even more fundamental structural differences I want to bring up. Um, I'll be quicker on the other points so other people can get into a conversation with us. Um, about, you know, really great questions at the end. I'll go to the third set of points next, I think. Um, 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 you know, uh, I'll just say some things quickly that I can't, Stephen has so many great points, I'm gonna try to address them all. Um, you know, why a proper name? Um, you know, you, 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 um, you're paying me a compliment here I don't deserve, which is that, you know, I have, as if I have this idea of this third genre sort of under control and have a complete sense of how to talk about it and what to call it. And I've decided, you know, that the app way to designate these is with a proper name. Um, and now, you know, you'd, you'd like to understand, you know, this well and considered, you know, choice. Um, it's not like that. Um, 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 I'm I'm doing that for want of anything better at the moment. Um, um, so I mean, I have a sense. I bet you have a sense of you know something distinctive, you know, in the dimensions of structure in these works that I'm trying to bring out. Um, that runs through a great many Hitchcock films, um, and for lack of a better word, I'm calling it a Hitchcock film. But um, but if the if that notion of third genre were properly theorized, I think it would be important that some Hitchcock films are more Hitchcock films than others. And early Hitchcock didn't fully know how to make a Hitchcock film. And then films by other directors could qualify as Hitchcock films in a relevant respect. So um so um so um so whatever is being done with that proper name, it, it'd be important that it not be understood, misunderstood. Um, it's just a kind of way of astounding, you know, the largest collection of of such items we have. Um, but I think other people have, you know, especially in the wake of Hitchcock, been inspired to make movies that ex do what I call exploding a genre from within. Um, um, and, and, and Hitchcock will do this in very different ways. I mean, and if we you know, if there were more time and room in the paper, an interesting comparison, I think, because it's so different, but yet structurally homologous in these respects, would be Shadow of a Doubt. I mean, that's a movie which I think on a first viewing, up to a point, we could think we're in a Frank Capra movie. You know, there's this sort of bucolic, small American town. There's this family. It it has the aspect of a certain kind of comedy, and like as I try to point out, and how we become more attuned to these things in a second or third viewing, even a first viewing of 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 Psycho, we we have these sort of glimpses of a darker undercurrent. I bring these out in you know certain remarks of um, Norman's in a first viewing of the first half of. Shadow of a Doubt, we have glimpses of a darker undercurrent in Uncle Charlie. But I think our tendency in a first viewing if for a certain kind of contemporaneous consumer or critic of American film um, is to sort of try to interpret these in the light of the sense that we're in a Capra movie, roughly speaking. Um, um, and so that'd be a very different case of the same thing of a film that's exploding a genre from within in the ways that, that I take it Hitchcock does. You know, it's, I'm not, it's not that the film noir, I want to say, is the genre, the Hitchcock films begin with or something that wouldn't be true. I think it would even be interesting to look at certain kinds of romantic comedies, you know, that are in the direction of comedies of remarriage and what happens to these um, in, 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 you know, work like Notorious, for instance. Um, so um, now, um, that's a segue to um, your second question, which I like as a question to me. Um, um, I think it'd be a great question for me to ask myself in the paper. Um, 
which is why shouldn't we think of what's happening as just the suturing of one genre, some other damn thing, onto this first genre? Um, in the case of um, psycho film noir, you know. But what I want to now, 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 first thing I want to say is there could be such movies. There could be a movie that sutures one genre into another, but that would be a movie that doesn't have what I call, you know, a generic false bottom. The, the part that's a film noir is a film noir. <laughs> um, and then something sutured onto it. Whereas what I want to say is, once we've seen Psycho a couple of times, we know it's not a film noir. <laughs> you know, our whole understanding of what's happening in the dialogue between Norman and Marion is hopelessly transformed in such a way that we can't just read these as, we can't simply hear the line of, um, we all go a little mad sometimes as, as meaning the Pippin thing it can mean, you know, and, and my sort of Pippin reading of what that remark would mean if it was about a Robert Mitchum character in a Robert Mitchum film noir who suddenly finds himself forever on the run <laughs> after one, one, one impulsive act. Um, or a Jane Greer character might be a better case. Um, 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 parallels Marion Cream better. I'm, I'm remembering a specific Jane Greer Mitchum noir here, but I can't remember what it's called. They wind up in Mexico. They're forever on the run. They just, it just keeps going. They don't stop running. <laughs> um, <coughs> um, um, so, so um, and you know, be even more, and this is why I chose the example absurd to say, The Shadow of a Doubt, you know, is a Capra movie with something else that you're not doing. It's not a Capra comedy. It's not even really a comedy, even though there's some funny dialogue, you know, in this family, in, you know, in the first part when we're first, you know, before we've, you know, had everything exploded. But when we watch it a second time, we no longer can take this to be a bucolic Capra town. You know, the, dar the darkness of the shadow that Uncle Charlie brings and how it's related to who the mother really is and, 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 and certain things and the younger child. It's all somehow come to the surface in a different way. And, and Charlie herself, the young Charlie, gives an amazing speech you know, at the end of the movie about what this town really is. You know, she's kind of pulled the face off of the Capra world. Um, if you recall that conversation in the bar, that little monologue she delivers. So, um, so it's not a suturing. You know, it really, I want to say, explodes the genre it seems to be in. So then a further view, we can't see it. I mean, a, a question you didn't ask, but I think another question one could ask if it's like this, because there's more examples of it. I mean, I can't really think of a clear case in the moment, but I bet we could find some of what you call just the suturing of one genre to another. I mean, it, it's, you know, it'd be interesting to think about why that's actually be quite a hard thing to make um, and still have a certain kind of unity. But what you do have a lot of, and some of them are really interesting, I think, are, 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 are forms of cinematic um, work that are hybrid genres, you know, um, you know, they're westerns and science fiction films, or you know, um, you know, I feel like saying about the series Justified that you know, it's both a noir and a western, you know, in a way that Pippin, you know, might imagine to be impossible, <laughs> um, and and so so and, and so I do think that's a thing that makes for an enormously interesting kind of free saw in a certain kind of cinematic work. Is, 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 to, is to somehow make something that participates in two genres that each seem to have their own necessarily um, extruding the other's logic form of internal intelligibility and yet somehow participate in both. But then that would not be the thing I'm talking about either. It's not that it have the false bottom of seeming like a noir the first time through. And then suddenly it seems like a Western, you know. You know, there's a gunfight in the opening moments. I mean, there's a kind of showdown with pistols, even though it's in a modern Florida restaurant, you know, in, in Justified in the first scene, where you can sort of feel the Westernness of it right away, as well as realizing this isn't the world of the Western somehow. <laughs> um, um, and so, um, so, so, so there, there are these cases where you could, you know, you could, there are ways of, as it were, doing, so we need more than three categories too. I didn't mean to be giving some kind of, there are three categories as, as you kind of summarized it, though I can see why this happened. Um, there are other ways of, as it were, inviting the generic expectations of a genre without simply being a case of it, which isn't the Hitchcock way of doing this, where, where, where the point is to construct um, this object that has what I call a generic false bottom. Um, so, so that the genre is exploded. You know, it really is participating in some way in the genre, in um, um, 
um, inviting those generic expectations, but it's not merely an instance of that genre. It's something more complicatedly um, dual, um, where it's in this, it's got a foot in this genre and a foot in something else. But what I want to say about um, Hitchcock is there's, there's a way in which in the end, you know, it doesn't have a foot in the film noir. It just works with the film noir, you know, to as it were, you know, um, to, to, as, as one of, of the devices through which um, it performs the sorts of things I, I say here a Hitchcock film does. Um, so um, that's some remarks about your second set of remarks. Um, but, but again, I think they're great questions or questions I think the both of those are questions that should, the, the author should put to himself um, and I will in advising this. So thank you very much. Um, and I think I'll probably get clear about some things um, um, and benefit from having been asked those questions and asking them myself in the paper. Now, the first set of issues you bring up are huge, so I don't want to say too much about them because I want people to have a chance to talk. And 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 in a way, don't really matter to the paper. Um, I mean, I mean, I don't mean to sound defensive here. I'm just trying to be honest. Um, um, the, the, the opening of the paper was really just for people who know nothing about. You, you you said something like, you know, anybody who's thought very hard about genre, you know is going to think this is a very bad way of thinking about genre that Jim is first concerned to um, criticize. But I'm worried there's a lot of us people out there still. And most people aren't careful readers of Cavell. And so I, I just want, I felt, you know, obliged, um, you know, to have some sort of background about sort of where I'm coming from and who my friends are. And I was trying to do that quickly. And so I wasn't um, trying to be at all careful about similarities and differences between Cavell and Pippin. Um, I wanted something... Um, I, I um, this is a dangerous use of the word, very generic, <laughs> that is shared in their conceptions of what a genre is. <laughs> um, um, and I wanted to bring that out at a sufficiently um, abstract level that um, um, the concept of myth played no role in what was sort of the generic common denominators of Cavell and Pippin's overarching conceptions of what a genre is. And I think Pippin does take himself to be influenced by Cavell in a certain way. But I also agree that's a somewhat washed out conception of genre he's working with compared to Cavell's. And I tried to say that briefly in passages you quote. Um, and, and so I think that, you know, many of the differences you point out are there, they're just there. I didn't mean to be denying them, um, um, but I might have seemed to. I do think, um, and I thought it was an interesting thing to remark, but I can see how it caused a lot of confusion because I just say it quickly in a sentence I had at the end of the footnote that, Pippin thinks, um, and this is not obvious from his two books, because there's just these two books, one on the noir and one on the Western, from this pair of books, um, that uh, that these are, you know, genres that are implicated in one another. You know, I was using the term loosely, adjacent genre, in a way that, you know, I think he was, you know, struck by the possibility of thinking this by things that Cavell says about um, remarriage comedies and um, melodramas um, of the unknown woman, but um, but he himself hasn't written much about that actually. Um, um, so, um, but but I do think he has the idea that these are both films that are response, you know, made in the same decades that are responses to the same modern, you know, you know, increasingly urban, increasingly political, you know, incipiently in um, Cold War and then post Cold War American reality um and so um and that um there there and that you know um one it, it, it can be that you know you negate certain features of the one and you get features of the other using this word negate in a very you know broad way now um so um and that's an, and so there i think there's an interesting connection he sees between the two that he hasn't himself theorized much and i meant to just be hinting that i don't think it cavell literally derives the concept of a of a melodrama of the unknown woman by starting with his account of the remarriage comedy, and then, as it were, as it were, pushing in the features and saying what would happen, and saying, and then he sort of d gives a transcendental deduction of you know the necessary possibility of a of the of the melodrama of the unknown woman. You could say simply from reflection <laughs> on uh, you know the comedy of remarriage, and then lo and behold, they exist. You know, and then he. Says, does us some of them. Whereas that's not at all what Pippin does. He just looks at one bunch of movies, kind of theorizes it from the other. Um, and I'm not sure you could give a transcendental deduction of the deduction of the of the noirs as Pippin describes it from um 
from the Western and vice versa, but they are implicating one another. But then the way they're implicating one another, I mean, I'll put this very vaguely. Um, 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 I, I mean, it would be worth thinking about how to put this more clearly. You know, I think in Pippin's picture is something like that. Um, what the Western does is it sort of looks at the American present through the lens of a certain kind of imagined, you know, moment of founding, you know, a certain kind of tale an American can tell himself you know, of how the desert became a garden or how, you know, we move from the state of nature to civil society or whatever. And, that, and the Western gives these sort of more determinants or as it were, specifications of what it would be to tell that story, you know, as the tale of Tombstone or whatever, <laughs> you know, um, or Dodge City. Um, uh, where, so 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 it's, 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 it's seeing the present in light of a displaced, fantasy of an imaginary past moment which then has been betrayed in the present um, or you know um, defines the contradictions that we cannot live up to in the present and these these often come out at, even at the end of the westerns for instance the you know um, um, you know the end of liberty balance um, um, whereas the noir he sort of sees as something like the imagination of an only slightly distant future, you know, um, relative to the contemporaneous moment of the making of that noir in the 40s, the 50s, or whatever it is, that, you know, brings out the full darkness and sense of um, um, fatalism that can overpower any sense of a possibility of hope, especially public hope, a hope that isn't just a private moment of a certain sort, you know, in the desert of the urban American sort of um, late capitalist um, 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 modern political, if we can even use that word, you know, the, um, you know, fragmentation of the political polis um, landscape. So, um, so that means, um, so now this is the last thing I want to say, the word myth in Cavell um, it's very clear, I think, if you look at pages 26 and 27 and the pages that follow from there and on the introduction to the comedy of remarriage, as Stephen says, you know, plays, as it were, a theoretical role in um, his elaborating the very idea of genre. Whereas the notion of myth that Pippin is using plays a special role in his elaboration of one of the two genres he's interested in, the Western, as opposed to the noir. I don't think the word myth even comes up in the noir book. So, it, so, so, so that's kind of confusing. And I didn't mean to, though I do say some things about myth when I talk about Pippin on the Westerns, I didn't mean to be building the word myth into their, their shared concept. So yeah, there are all these differences. I didn't even mean to be denying that because the word myth is, is, is playing a certain role in um, articulating what genre is for Cavell. Where, you know, the examples he really has in mind in the first instance are Shakespearean comedies and tragedies and Northrop Fry on those. And um, certain kinds of Hollywood comedies and um, and um, melodramas. Um, I mean, I do think it's a question how much one could give a general theory of the concept of genre that applies to you know you know all kinds of other works of art where the concept of myth would continue to have that centrality that Cavell wants to give it. I mean, I think if one wants to kind of generalize out Cavell's concept of genre, then one's going to have to loosen the hold that the concept of myth can happen organizing these. The, the, the specific constellation he has. So I don't think it's um, a mistake um, <laughs> that, that Pippin doesn't try to give this concept a central role in um, his kind of the noir. So, so, so I, I didn't, um, so I think that was just a confusion. So, so this, 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 that was just a confusion I created by both saying there's certain, you know, generic similarity, what Cavell and Pippin do when they theorize a genre and what they see participation in genres and then having the word myth which I didn't mean to be part of that topic, come up in the account of Western. But then it could seem like I'm, I'm invoking that sort of structural feature of the logic of genre that Cavell has in mind. And then I'm clearly getting, I would be getting all kinds of things wrong, but I didn't mean to be doing that. But I wasn't even imagining a reader who was well-versed enough in these matters to notice that possible um, um, misunderstanding. And so I'm, I'm glad to have it also called to my attention. I, I need to ward it off. Well, as I bring people back, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm interrupted, interrupting, but um, I just want to, well, first, thank you both for this fascinating conversation. 
Uh, we are officially already, you know, beyond our agreed upon time limit, but since it's the last session, it's less of a problem. So if Jim is up to it, we could, you know, use some more minutes for, for our conversation. And But of course, if someone has to leave, you know, just please let us know and feel free to, to do it. Uh, it's a, is it okay, Jim? Yeah, it's, it's the middle of the afternoon here. <laughs> okay, uh, Arata, I think, has the first question, and then just if, if anybody else wants to go, let me know. Hi, Arata. Hey, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> lovely to see you, lovely to hear you. Um, uh, lovely, wonderful paper, um, and thank you, Stephen, too. For, uh, that was um, this wonderful set of responses and uh, and uh, so I, I guess uh, this is just uh, sort of an open invitation um, uh, and there's it seems like there's a kind there's a bit of an affinity um, between um, the situation that um, it seems like implicitly the viewer of, of psycho is in you know on, on your account of uh, um uh the work that um uh psycho is uh is to do so to speak on on the viewer um uh and and this is like connected to you know your point i you know you said the beauty of hitchcock is that he does not cheat or he does not um uh that it's that 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 so to speak, what is there to be seen is 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 just is there to be seen, um, and uh, we're not but we're not struck by it because of the expectations that we're bringing to the scene and the um, uh, and the expectations that we're led to have. Um, we're not just bringing it, but 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 we're 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 led to have. Um, uh, by the way that Hitchcock sets the scene up. Um, uh, and so I, I guess my, my question, this just to um, bring back like another um, aspect of uh, uh, an, another like passage where um, uh, and from Cavell, from uh, King Lear, the King Lear essay um, uh, where he says, um, uh, now it's it's a long, beautiful passage, um, but the what uh, it says, you know, I'm, I'm assuming that uh, it is the criticism is inherently immodest and melodramatic, not merely from its temptations to uninstructive superiority and to presumptuous fellow feeling, but from the logic of its claims, in particular from two of its elements. Um, one, a critical position will finally rest upon calling a claim obvious. And two, a critical discovery will present itself as the whole truth of a work, a provision of its total meaning. Um, and, you know, of course, like he goes on to, this seems outlandish. Why would anyone engage in this activity of criticism, given that 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 belongs to the logic of criticism? And, you know, he says, well, you only think that it's, it, it might be outlandish, you know, if you take obviousness as a claim to certainty, and totality is a claim to exhaustedness. Um, uh, and so like, I don't know, it, it, it somehow seems to me that, that there's, um, that there might be a connection between the, what, the way that, that the psycho is being structured and the position of the critic, so to speak. Um, uh, and, um, the uh um th th that in a sense it sort of seems to be exemplifying that position by um uh by so to speak inviting criticism that is that 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 is described in the way that, that cavell describes it um as though as though that there's a critic that or that that conception of criticism is embodied in the way that the film is structured and and um so i i don't know i'm i this i don't know if this is far-fetched or 
or off, but care to comment on it? <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, I was trying to say this in places in the paper, including a one bit I read out, but I'm not saying it well enough. I wish I wish we were recording this session, so I had a recording of what you just said. I could go back and listen. We are recording, Jimmy. Are recording. Yeah, that's fabulous. I want to listen to everything about it said again. Um, I mean, I have a written version of what Stephen said. That guy. Um, but um, yeah. I mean, I mean, I think you're, you know, you're putting it better than I did in some ways. The paper. I mean, there's a moment in what I read out <coughs> where I say something like, um, I'm trying to say something like, it's not an accident that a certain kind of theorist, of whom I'm actually criticizing, who loves the kind of moment in filmmaking that I describe as cinematically theatrical, and really. A kind of film that's almost made for a certain kind of film theorists. Also loves Hitchcock films. <laughs> but I say, in sort of celebrating the moments of the Hitchcock film he thinks to be the deepest, he's actually sort of focusing on the shallow end of the false bottom and mistaking that for its depth. That is, that Hitchcock almost makes a film that seems tailored to a certain kind of theory in order to defeat that theory's conception of, of, of such matters. Um, so that, you know, he is arrogating to himself the work of the kind of critic in order to understand his work that Cavell describes, who will make these hubristic claims. But, um, but, um, but not misunderstood in the ways that you so beautifully articulated. Um, um, so, um, so, so that, I mean, um, you know, in, in a nutshell, that was the kind of thing I was trying to say at various points in the paper, um, um, including even in one bit I read out. It's mostly in the in the back end of the paper that I didn't read out that I said this, but um, but um, but it was to come up in that one moment where I was talking about the fact that, um, yeah, you know, even this film critic will love the shower sequence, but they'll tend to focus on you know all the things we can't help but notice the first time, <laughs> um, you know, or, or could notice at least on the first time, um, rather than things we can't possibly notice until a second time. Um, so, um, so, so yes, um, yes to that. Um, um, and this of course is connected with the point that you were making at the very beginning about Hitchcock doesn't cheat. I mean, and that's something else I, uh, is again, um, like the expression Hitchcock film, is really kind of a placeholder for something I, I still don't completely know how to say in a short number of words. But but I do feel like reporting to everyone else in this group, I think my first really clear experience of fully appreciating this about Hitchcock movies was in connection with Vertigo. Um, discussing everyone else in this group, I think my first really clear experience of fully appreciating this about Hitchcock <laughs> movies was in connection with Vertigo. Sorry, I was hearing my own voice from there. Um, 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 an experience of, of, you know, thinking about Vertigo that I had with a couple of graduate students I live with when I was a graduate student, um, one of whom was Arata Hamawaki. And we just talked, you know, you know, as I remember it, for about a million hours about Vertigo. <laughs> we, you know, we would be washing the dishes or something, and then something suddenly one of us had to say something about Vertigo. <laughs> um, so, but um, I mean, but I mean, I mean, there's all kinds of ways this is happening in Vertigo. But I mean, one I think great example is, for instance, um, on some further viewing of the film, for example, for those of you who know it, the Madeline character. Um, um, it's been a while since I've seen that film. What's 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 her real name? Is she's from Salinas, Kansas, and her name is Vicky? Is that right, Vicky? But I can't remember. What's the name of the girl from Salinas, Kansas? Is she Vicky? I'm going to call her Vicky for lack of a better name. Judy. Judy. Thank you, Judy. Yes, Judy. Judy. It's Judy. Thank you. Um, um, so um, you know, at a certain point when she's starting to sort of lose it, when Jimmy Stewart is insist, you know, wants her to go up to, to run towards the tower, um, he needs to re, and they're having this conversation, you know, um, you know, you know, next to the carriage and the barn. Um, when, at a certain point, I think, and one can hear this in other earlier moments when she's struggling between, as it were, the role she has to play for Gavin Lawrence and um, for, the, for the Gavin character and for, um, and she's falling in love with, 
with a Scotty. So there's certain kinds of conflicts in her. And at a certain point, I think it's, it's clearest in this case, in this sort of penultimate scene in which we see her um, before she dies, um, or yeah, is um, that the Judy character is kind of losing her grip on the ability to act the part of the Madeline character. So, you know, what we clearly can hear once we sort of start looking for it in third or fourth viewings is her breaking from the sort of upper crust almost slightly British sounding refined accent to the the cadence of the Midwestern Kansas Judy. Her, her voice is sort of cracking and moving between those. And it's a fantastic performance um, of her, as it were, acting the part of someone who's losing control of someone who's acting a part. But when we first see the movie, we don't notice this at all. And I think, you know, to the extent that we schematize it at all, um, you know, we, you know, we take in, we just think, well, this isn't perfect acting or something. <laughs> it's like, it's just, she's having a little trouble. You know, but, but we probably don't even notice at all. It just escapes our notice. And then there's this whole layer of the one character who's in the other character who we can discern as present. And Hitchcock has put that there. He hasn't cheated. You know, he hasn't made the performance perfect. So it has to dupe a Scotty. But we, like Scotty, allow ourselves to be duped. Um, and then we can see ourselves being duped in all kinds of ways. We can see it's a Vicky who's playing the part of a Madeline. Um, when we watch it again. Um, and it's a, that's just a very clean example of what I mean, it, you know, by um, he doesn't cheat. Um, you know, it's, it's much subtler to bring this out in Vertigo, or it has to be much more, as it were, momentary, like the way in which we can just see this is actually Anthony Perkins dressed in women's clothes, who's bringing that knife down for much higher on Marion Crane, you know. But that's just like a moment. But but there's, um, but it's not that that's been withheld, but we, we just sort of take it as cinematic filmmaking, that that figure in shadow is, of course, the mother, because we know it's the mother. <laughs> and we, we just sort of take it as German expressionist excess, somehow that the knife is coming from above or whatever. Um, um, so, um, so, um, so, um, so, so, so it's that kind of structure of depth, um, that, 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 that such a critic, I think, doesn't know how to look for in his sense of, as it were, what is, you know, deep <laughs> in a movie, um, the kind of thing that they're looking for, um, um, in, in the, um, part of the paper I only finally translated from German, um, a few hours ago after I said it to everyone, and I'm trying to get this whole thing in English. Um, well, I still don't remember what's in the paper. Um, I have a bit where I talk about um, safe ground, and I kind of draw an analogy between the kind of safe ground we hanker for as people that are watching the narrative. You know, we're watching the shower scene. We're, we're sort of hoping somehow, you know, as she grabs the curtain or something, that she's somehow going to stabilize herself. You know, and in some later phase where we, we, we keep hoping somehow... Um, that um, things will resolve it in such a way that, you know, we no longer have to worry, you know, about what's coming around the corner at us at the next turn of this movie. I, I, I try to draw an analogy at, between how this sort of release that we seek absorbed in the drama, the kind of safe ground we hanker after, where we increasingly come to appreciate not only is there no point of release, but we, we sort of lose our grip on what it is we want release from or what we could, you know, be released to. <laughs> um, has its counterpart in the way in which our interpretive activity, our certain conception of you know what it is to understand this, gives way to false bottoms in which you know a certain picture of closure or you know totality of interpretation you know itself kind of melts away on us at a certain point in our encounter with this movie. That there's there's a certain kind of um, parallelism between this form of as it were absorption in the drama and this form of interpretive reflection. On the character of the work, um, it's, it's something I try to bring out, and I think it's connected with um, the real interesting analogy that Stephen was pointing out that Cavell was making about a Beckett work and a Hitchcock work, which Cavell kind of mischievously allows himself to use the concept of suspense, or the way you mean suspended, in a relation to the work, um, to sort of you know hit off as a parallel. So. Um, so, so that's just a way of saying, yeah, I completely agree with you. Um, I think I understand you. And these are things I actually want to have in the paper, and I'm still trying to find ways to put them. I, 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 you can see me sort of stumbling. I feel like uh, I have a sense of the things I want to say here, but I, don't, I haven't quite found the words to sort of crystallize these aspects of what Hitchcock is doing as clearly as I'd like to. Thanks a lot, Jim. Thank you. Um, 
Uh, I yeah, I'll let other people um, ask questions. I I I say I might have to just um, leave um, because um, of a of a prior comm commitment, but um, uh, but I will say goodbye until then. <laughs> I'll, I'll stick around until I have to leave. But um, thanks, Sarah. <laughs> and bye. <Yeah. laughs> uh, anybody else has questions? No? I... Uh, go ahead. Go, go ahead. ahead. No, no, okay. please. Um, yeah, I, I have just very quickly, if you could maybe talk some more about the psychiatrists in Hitchcock movies. It was in a part of a paper that you didn't. Uh, much read and I would like to hear more about it because I found um, that so fascinating how you took that little passage from Cavell and seems to give even more life to it. If you could please comment on it. Yeah, I mean, I sort of thought um, there's lots of things Cavell says in that passage. I just I felt a bit lazy. I just let stand without commenting. There's a whole meditation there about, you know, what we want is a certain kind of knowledge. You know, we want to replace, you know. Um, um, Forms of response that such a movie elicits with, in us with a certain kind of knowledge. <laughs> and this is itself a kind of invasion. <coughs> Both of the claim the work makes on us, but that parallels some sort of evasion we go in for in our lives. Um, um, and that, you know, the sort of pseudo explanatoriness of uh, the psychiatrist sort of parallels that. Um, yeah, the, 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 the bit I was just talking to you with Arada about. Um, that you know there wasn't even in the version you read yet um, the insurance it, yeah, about safe ground is actually in the discussion of the psychiatrist um, 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 was, so um, so 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 you know what the psychiatrist does you know is you know he purports to get this is what the people in that room is like what happened you know, <laughs> you know, you know what's what's happened in our town and you know what the per psychiatrist you know purports to do is give exactly, if you will, a kind of interpretation of what's just happened that um, mirrors the kind of interpretation that Arata was talking about, that Cavell and that I was saying the Hitchcock film itself is trying to, you know, elicit the expectations of such a theorist in order to treat them. So what the psychiatrist purports to do is tie up all the loose ends. You know? When the psychiatrist is done, we understand everything. We understand, you know, you know who's there and what happened to Norman and, you know, you know, who committed the, you know, people ask questions, the psychiatrist says, well, no, well, actually, the mother, you know, and so sort of corrects people's questions, and he sort of has the right answer, you know, he's, he's, he really understands what's going on, you know, and, and, um, and, you know, when he's done speaking, you know, you know, even though he doesn't speak that long, the mood, the tone, I, I'd be nice if I could, you know, I need to say more things about not just what the psychiatrist says, but the tone in which he says them, um, we need to go through the dialogue, um, you know, it's one of, we have been, you know, all loose ends have been tied up. We have been given closure. And then I was trying to read the next two shots as then, you know, giving us that and then just taking away, you know, in the, in the next gesture. Um, 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 you know, we, we, we're not, we are left with something, if we notice it, as I was suggesting, it might take us a second viewing even to notice that dissolve into and out of the skull. Um, you know, you're left very unsettled at the end, you know. Um, 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 you know, we... we um, we return to you know an even you know deeper glimpse of what I was calling that dark undercurrent. Um, so um, so um, so so I am sort of seeing him you know as someone who's you know a kind of trope for this desire for what I was calling the theoretical explanatory safe ground that ties everything up and the work of interpretation is done and now we understand everything. What it is to understand a work of art in this picture as to have said the last word and your theory you know. Maybe it's about how these things, you know, are to be understood in terms of late capitalism or, you know, the phallocentric male gaze or, you know, it could be anything. You have a little, you know, and everything is to be understood and we organize everything according to this principle and then we are more or less done. And if there's more work to do, it's just, as it were, turning the wheels, I mean, of the kinds of, you know, as it were, forms of explanation that the psychiatrist in this case has given us. Um, um, and, um, and so psychoanalysis here, I think, you know, and a number of Hitchcock's films, Cavell suggests, you know, serves as a trope, you know, for this kind of, um, as it were, modus of interpretation that can cover everything, but cover everything in a sort of totalizing way, which suggests that, you know, 
the fundamental horizon of what it is, of, of, of kinds of considerations, of kinds of concepts that need to be deployed, forms of understanding that need to be brought into effect, to understand has already been delineated. Um, and that's exactly, I think, um, it's exactly um, the opposite of the conception of the kind of work that Hitchcock wants to present. Um, his audience with, and both, I think, the opposite of Hitchcock's conception of what art is, great art is, a, a conception that he sort of sees himself as trying to bring to the cinema. Um, so, uh, so, so, so that, that's how I was trying to use the psychiatrist in the paper, and I, and it's actually a part where um, it's still missing a bunch of things I want to say about it. But I wanted to give you guys a little bit of a taste of that um, bit of the paper, so that's why I stuck it in there. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Jonathan, this please. Well, uh, I had one question that it's a little external to the main concerns of the paper, but it's central to, at least for Cavell's project of understanding the ontology of film. And I know you probably thought about this, so I would like to hear you. Uh, there is one place, I, I don't have the page number because it is in my Kindle, but it's kind of closer to the end where you compare the question, what is montage? Mon is it the way, correct way of saying yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. With, uh, <laughs> with what is meaning. And you say that at this absolutely hope hopeless level of generality, this is an ill-posed question. Um, what else? Um, Well, anyway, the, the, uh, the, the question I wanted to raise has to do with this distinction that is normally used in film theory between like formalist yes. views of film and realist views of film. And the question has to do with, would you say something similar to, about the question, what is realism or what is the role of reality in film? Because this is important for Cavell because as you know, of course, but in case doesn't. <laughs> normally Cavell is presented as a realist theorist yes. of film as opposed mm -hmm. to the formalist ones. Yes. And that of course is because he in part influenced by Bazin and Panofsky yes. says that there is something yes. fundamental about the role of reality in film. But he also says that what is important to ask is what happens to reality with reality when it is film projected. So he seems to imply that many things, many different things can happen. There is no one way that reality, yes. um, you know, contributes to, to, to the content of a film. So I, I just would like to hear you if you have something about yes. to say about that. Yes. Well, I mean, well, I, I mean, I think I have too many things to say about it. Um, um, but uh, but I'll say some things. <laughs> um, um, I mean, first I should maybe say this isn't external to what is on my mind when I when I first came to write about these things. I was in I'm sort of as you, as I think Jonah and us knows working on a book, you know, occasionally, but it gets it gets interrupted by other books and also working on other things I write on. So every once in a while I come back to movies, and thanks to you guys, I'm doing that this week it seems. Um, 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 and 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 the. And it's a book, you know, that bears the title "The Ontology of the Cinematographic Image," and um, and it's about these questions, the ones that Jonas was asking about. And I envision a chapter on Psycho as the last chapter in that book. So, um, so I'm trying to, as it were, particularize certain points I'm making um, on an example. And I and, and I and I gave sort of a three lecture version of sort of the structure of the book once in Johns Hopkins with a third lecture in Psycho, and that was in English. But the discussion was all connected with the first two chapters, and then I gave a self standing paper on Psycho in the shower scene in German. And actually, the text I created for you was sort of drawn from both of those things. But the problem with the thing I had in English is that it involves all this vocabulary and ideas drawn from the previous chapters that aren't developed. And, the lecture, so I was trying to get them out. So one of the things I was doing is I was sending you these successive versions as I was taking out, you know, stuff, you know, distinctions between register one and register three. If you saw something about that and what you read, I was trying to take all that out and hadn't gotten it all out because it belonged to the other discussion. So, so I, I, I this, so my, but I want actually in a fuller discussion of this to contextualize it in the larger book and say how it, 
you know, a proper understanding of, you know, what I take to be Bazan and Cavell's insights um, could be seen to be, as it were, illustrated um, through the kind of discussion of cycle I'm giving. So, I, I, so, I, so that's just a long and winded way of saying I don't take this to be external at all. <coughs> <laughs> to my larger concerns, um, it was actually kind of the source of how I came to write this. Um, but now, um, you know, in, in those, you know, previous chapters, um, I mean, I do think, you know, the way people understand formalism and realism involve, you know, understandings um, of these matters that I think kind of fail to take up even the most basic insights of Bézat and Cavell, you know. So, I mean, I think the formalism involves a sort of picture of what, you know, is in the image or in the screen that imagines it can abstract from our phenomenology, our experience, our understanding of what we see. Um, and, and I just think um, that's a completely confused notion of formalism. There's a kind of idea of like merely cinematic signs, which I think is just totally confused. Um, um, and, and I have some criticisms of that, you know, so there's a picture of, you know, what is subjective camera and they'll try to describe it by saying, you know, by saying some things like we see exactly what we see through some desire, it's placed in a certain way. None of this will work. I mean, all kinds of things I think in movies can be understood to be point of view shots or subjective camera. There isn't a way to do it. And you can do that same thing and be understood to be something very different. So I don't think there's any way to, as it were, characterize the form of what we see in the merely formalistic terms of the formalist. That is, um, by just as it were, trying to pull the image you know, from our understanding of the world. That's why I start with the idea of the world of a movie, an understanding of as it were, what the shape and structure of that world is that we see. We have to see into a world to see anything. And it's that that allows us to have an understanding of, um, of you know, it's, it's that concept of form that has to organize all the subordinate concepts of form. I try to bring this out by saying things about how the form, for instance, of a documentary nonfiction movie is fundamentally different than the form of, um, of um, a Hollywood movie, for instance. Um, and, um, but the concept of montage or point of view shot or something could, that the theorist works with, you could use them either. You know, they, don't, they don't sort of see the depth of the difference of what those words would even mean within those two different cinematic forms. And then that would allow for all kinds of Stephen Mulhall like questions about how these can be subverted, um, you know, within each. Um, and, you know, a lot of interesting things that have happened in documentary and in Hollywood have involved, you know, various ways of, as it were, subverting or, or reshaping those media. Um, <coughs> but now, um, so, Conversely, um, the realist conception is one that, you know, suffers from the same flaw as far as I'm concerned. It fetishizes a different thing. But, you know, the sense in which a photograph is realist and, and, and newsreel documentary is realist and um, a neorealist Italian movie is realist which I think makes a kind of artful use of, as it were, certain outer formal aspects of the newsreel without being a newsreel. <laughs> um, and um, the sense in which you could say, you know, a certain kind of scene in a Western was realistically shot, all mean the same thing. You know, it's, it's this notion of realism is something we're supposed to be able to pick out sort of independently of the concept of form I want, um, one in which the form and the matter cannot be separated in the way in which I think. Um, so I, so I, th I think of both of... Um, Realism and formalism is having, you know, to borrow some philosophical concepts I develop elsewhere, you know, an irre irresolutely hylomorphic conception. They see the form and the matter as things that can just come apart. And then the formalism separates this idea of form that comes apart from the matter. And then the realism separates this conception of the, the reality content <laughs> that the photograph just gives us apart from the form. Because I think there is neither a form nor, as it were, an access to a reality unless they form a certain kind of unity. And, and, and the real place of form is one of you know, articulating that unity. And, and, and then what one needs to say is very different for what I would say are fundamentally different aesthetic media. Um, so, so that's why I don't really like, one of the things I do is kind of use the word film as this sort of hopeless word and then develop a certain concept of the Hollywood movie as a medium. Um, but you know, film is in a sense, not a medium. I mean, what gathers all the things we call film is kind of more like, you know, 
film stands to as concept of aesthetic medium i think kind of the way the word paint stands to you know um, you know um various concepts of you know painterly medium you know um you know and you know and the fact that my walls are white does not mean that they're an artwork <laughs> you can use paint for lots of things and you can use the technology for lots of things um and so um so um so that's the first thing. So I think formalism and realism are sort of very far from understanding anything in Bizan and Cavell. But there is something in Bizan and Cavell I also want to criticize, um, which is, um, and, 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 and is playing a background role in the way I'm thinking about Psycho. Um, so that, um, you know, this is just an ex observation, historical observation, but I think it's a very interesting thing to take on. I mean, I mean, one thing is, I think, just a little more important to me than it is to them, though. Bezan has a little bit to say about this in connection with theater, is the way in which the initial intelligibility of the motion pictures as an art form was possible, depended upon the ways in which they adopted, embodied, and transformed forms of world-making or world-presenting that you had in the other arts. And I think the three most important cases of this, though there are others, was um, what we might call, using the same word advisedly, the realistic novel, which involves certain kind of narrative voice, and certain kind of difference between authorial voice and, 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 and the voice of the character, and various kinds of ways of mediating perspective onto what we might call the world of the novel. And the classical realistic stage, um, I think, whose great first, theorists were Lessing and Diderot, um, and the idea of a fourth wall, and the way in which we're drawn into, as it were, the ontological separateness of the stage from the theater and the action within it, and um, the narrative painting, and the way in which a certain kind of organization of the image showed us that what we saw, in one sense, in a moment, had the logic of the dilation of a narrative so that we, we we read the thing as having a temporal extension there's a story we don't read it as a snapshot we read it as um the depiction of a scene of a battle there's different things um and it, it needs to have a certain kind of organizational unity um, um and diderot and then building upon a michael freed has a lot to say about how such a narrative painting must be um organized in order that it absorb us in a certain kind of way and one of the things it must do is it must deny the beholder, it must deny the pre must be organized in such a way that it actively suggests that there is no point of view from from you know within the painting that could disclose the world of the painting in this way. Um, it sort of seals itself off from us. Um, and I think that the, the various conventions, even the simplest conventions of cutting, that suggest you know things like parallel action and the ways of presenting things. I mean, a point I make to my students is if you just take the channel changer and flip through the TV channels, you will immediately be able to tell whether it's whether you see a person's face or whether you see a landscape. You, you can immediately tell, are you watching a nature documentary or are you watching a Hollywood movie? How you do this for landscape is different for how you do it in a shot. If it's a per but if you see a person's face, you can also tell. If I ask you, well, how do you know that's a Hollywood movie? I think you'll probably say things like, oh, it has Tom Cruise in it, and Tom Cruise is an actor, and so it's a Hollywood movie. But, you know, it could be an interview with Tom Cruise, you know, instead of a kind of, you know, that actually isn't how you tell, I think. It's, it, that's, that was a, that's an insufficiently deep sign. You know, and, and I have some discussion of how you tell, <laughs> you know. Um, but it has to do with all kinds of subtle things, like, for instance, what the actor is doing with his eyes. But one of the things uh, that, that Tom Cruise will not do with his eyes is ever look directly into the camera. Nobody will ever. The camera is actually the point where nobody ever looks. And that's part of what, as it were, leads to an understanding that what we see is seen from a point of view that is not within the world of that which we see. And that is fundamentally different from what a camera does if it's giving you documentary footage, where you understand there is a path through space and time between where I am now and what I see. And it, it, you know, there is a point of view from which everything in a documentary is seen, where the cameras, and that world has a camera in it with that point of view. <laughs> um, um, 
and and the concept of subjective point of view in a Hollywood movie is not that and you add something. It's something that has to encode, as it were, the sealed offness of that world. And then the idea of point of view within a world that we that um that there is no path in space and time from where I am now to what's happening there. Um so um that means as I put it, one of the things that the movies had to do in order to be born as an, an, a fictional narrative art form, that is to turn film into movie, is it had to defeat what I call the default ontology of the photographic image. Um, and I mean, it, it just an interesting little historical reflection is that it's an interesting fact that photographs never managed to succeed as um, a, you know, um, before the advent of cinema, I should say, in the 19th century, early 20th century, um, as a form of aesthetic medium for representing a fictional world. People tried to do things like, to, you know, depict the life of Christ in photographs. But, but people were disgusted by them. It just didn't work. They didn't want them, you know. They wanted paintings of Christ. They don't want, you know. A photograph was just a photograph of a person looking like Christ. It wasn't, you know putting you in the world of the body. And it was kind of disgusting. Um, and, 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 you know, even, you know, the, er and the early, e you know, so the, th there's a certain conception of reality that informs, you know, as it were, the, as it were, aesthetic of the documentary photograph in which you were cheating, you know, if you change certain things. Um, but, but I think Cavell and Bezan's conception of realism in the photographic medium is a little bit too tied to that conception of, as it were, what I call the default ontological meaning of the photographic images. First in photography, but then in moving pictures, if what we mean by that is, you know, newsreel or, you know, the filming of an interview or something like that, that, you know, the movies can only be born if they defeat this and that they're very elaborate things that a movie has to do. There's a language of, 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 of juxtaposition of images, which we are fluent consumers of. And so just like as a native speaker of Portuguese, um, until you learn a foreign language, you might not be very good at saying what the rules of grammar of Portuguese are. And if I just like take an introductory Portuguese class, even though my Portuguese is terrible, I could like tell you what the rule is for that, even though I, it seems to me incredibly complicated to get it right all the time, whereas you do it effortless. We don't have a sort of, necessarily reflective consciousness of the grammatical rules we effortlessly follow. I think as consumers of movies, we have an incredibly profound fluency in, as it were, the, the, the world creating dimensions of cinematic narration that allow the cinematic image to have what I'm calling its default ontology, which is, as it were, one that opens up, you know, this huge chasm between that world and our world. In the way that the um, you know fourth wall does in the theater and so on and so forth, the other cases, and it even I think drew and, and sort of synthesized these devices from the other arts, and that was part of what people they were drawing on in that that background before there were movies, so people could begin to understand something like a Griffith movie. Um, so um, so I think that changes a lot of I think that that introduces a kind of flavor into what we need to understand by what it is to say, the cinematic image has a realistic character. Um, that um, that um, I kind of miss in Bazin and Cavell's sort of quick transition <laughs> from you know the photographic medium you know in the way of um, now I think some of what Cavell says about world projection, especially when he wants to extend the notion of medium so it applies to genre, you know he's clearly overthinking about film form in a way that I'm very comfortable with, but but I but I don't but I but I feel like he doesn't see like as how huge a leap that is, <laughs> I mean so. So I would, I think, you know, I am sympathetic to, I think I kind of want to save every sentence in the worldview. There's something, it means something that I would want to agree with, but I think um, it would have to be clarified in such a way that those sentences would have to be understood in very different ways. We're talking about photography. We're talking about motion pictures that have, you know, what I would call the default ontology of the photographic image um, moving. And if, if it's, a certain kind of movie, and then they're, you know, and then what happens within the movies is this is further speciated. I mean, the default ontology of a science fiction film is a much more complicated 
thing than the default in a certain way than the default ontology of you know um sam spade san francisco in the maltese falcon which is not our san francisco but it's not exactly not our san francisco either <laughs> so um so so th th this opens up a topic so so i do think most of the you know ways in which people try to locate Bazin and cavell between formalism and realism are just stupid i think a good reading of them will explode the premises of that discussion but then once one sort of tries to think through what i was calling this resolutely hylomorphic conception of a medium and see how we need one that's specific to the movie not just the film um then i think that also complicates things in ways that i um found that um though i could use cavell as an inspiration for i couldn't just use him as a guide and then you know i mean all of the things i'm saying about how montage works you know in the shower sequence and it depends upon this being a movie not that it's just being filmed i mean there would be nothing for montage to do in these ways in a documentary i think <laughs> um so um so that's the beginning of an answer to your question on us but i think you know i think it's like the tip of an iceberg of, of, of things to say but i do think there is a connection between what i'm talking about in this kind of much more microscopic detail and looking at the scene in hitchcock and these larger questions are pointing to it we need to get those those two to fit together in the right way. And I want to do that. Thanks, Jim. That was really, really good and super clarifying. And uh, I will also have to get back to this recording <laughs> and, and listening to it again. Let me just repeat the request I already made. Please write that book <laughs> yeah, on the ontology of film. Yeah, the problem is some other people are saying that about some of the other books too. <laughs> I know, I know. Anyway. But one of them was out some months ago, so perhaps now it's... Yeah, no, no, the, these beach whales do eventually get pushed into the ocean. Um, so uh, so I, I'll try to push this one, that one into the ocean too, so it can swim off and have a life of its own. Should we call it a day, people? We are one hour uh, more than we agreed upon, but that was great, great conversation. And I would just like to thank everybody, especially Andrea, who has been quiet here, but she's been uh, helping from the start, the whole conference. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrea. Igor, too. And thank you for everybody who participated. I hope I can meet you all in person someday. We hope that, too. So if, if you need an excuse to give a course or something to write that book, just let me know and we can arrange something. That's a good idea. <laughs> I, I, excuses, it's always helpful to actually feel like you're talking to a human being when you're trying to find the words. To say these things and you don't quite know what the right words are so um, that's a good idea great well bye bye then thank you bye thank you so much i'm sorry that i've been sick and so i i both have not you know i didn't read the paper very well and i had to miss the conference so. not at all we are really really thankful for your effort and it was amazing yes thanks. Okay. Will you send me the recording of this um or show me yes how of course yes but it will be on youtube so Yes. You just need to Google, Google it, but I will send you this. Yes. I want to hear what Arata said again. <laughs> Great. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. Thanks so much, guys. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. How do okay, I bye.